Good catching up. I just want to test the sound real quick and see how this sounds. Uh, people can hear me. I, there won't be as much shatter when I'm actually doing this. Now I'm going to test. How do you turn on the projectors? How do you turn on the projectors? Anyone know? Is there a... Uh, is it this? I tried to... Oh, there we go, there we go. This one's on. This one is not on, though. Do I just point it at that? Oh, no, it's coming on. Okay.
My name's Dylan. Hey Dylan, good to see you. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I just want to ask you a few questions. Will these slides be available for us afterwards? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll post them online. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. it. Probably, yeah. We'll post the video online too. So. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll also post the slides. I'll make sure to do that. Uh, I am. Well, I'm working at a company right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, called 21. I'm working there doing blockchain stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, I'm kind of like, I'm kind of like, kind of talking about how you found out on the table. Okay. Well, this should be this should be a good starting place. Okay. So yeah. Well, I hope you enjoy the talk. I think it'll be like a good. If you don't know much about cryptocurrencies, it'll be a good way to like kind of uh, warm yeah, up and get you to read all the like, white papers, all the concepts, but I just can't, don't know how to code them. Right, right, right. Actually, right. Actually, right. right. Well, yeah. come come talk to me afterwards. Yeah. Like if, if yeah. you feel like this is uh, stuff that makes sense, yeah, yeah, yeah. Point you in the direction where to go next. Yeah, it's me, man. Okay. Hey, this for you. I've seen you only on the videos. So I've seen you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Love passion, your grandpa. Uh, <laughs> I, I hear that a lot. Yeah, yeah. anyways. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think it's going to be fun. Hope you enjoy it. Hey, how you doing, man? Pretty good. Good to see you. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, I just You're uh, yeah. looking like very Papa Soil all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, I just had to go here. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Are you still at Groupon? Uh, no. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Yeah, the new minis there. I see, I see. It's too bad. It's too bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Well, I hope you enjoy the talk. Yeah. Thanks so much for talking.
time, man. Yeah, let me know what you think of it. Okay. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Let's go this for doing the lights. Turn the lights. Turn the lights. Here we go. Lights are dimming. Ooh, ooh. A bit, a bit too much? Let's get a little bit lighter. Uh, actually, I don't know how it's going to come off on the on the webcam. So I want to make sure the webcam graphics will see me. Uh, I think you can hold it. Yeah. And then you can slowly go. Okay. 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 That's fine. Uh, yeah, I guess jo I told Jonathan as well, but if anything is like messed up, just come let me know so I can fix it. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, how's it going, everybody? How are we doing? Doing good? Good. Uh, uh, Monday? Today's Monday, right? Today's Monday. Yes, today's Monday. Uh, how's, your, how's your guys' Monday going? Solid. Not too bad. Uh, I'm trying to kill a bit of time because technically I want to start right at 6.30 so people tune in late online. They, you know, they catch everything. Um, anybody do anything interesting this uh, this weekend? Flex Friday. Flex Friday. Okay, <laughs> not Happy Academy related. Uh, just like something from your life. We saw dance battles in Berkeley. You saw dance battles. That's awesome. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Anybody else? Anything cool this weekend? You built a blockchain. You built a blockchain, just like in preparation for this. Yes. Okay. Well, it might be better than what I come up with. In which case. Out of Legos. Out of Legos. <laughs> okay. That that. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I don't think you need to watch this, this talk then. This is the Lego talk, so you know this will be pretty short. Uh, it's going to be mostly mostly hand demos, but uh, hope you guys weren't expecting too much. Okay, uh, awesome. Then I think let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. So, hello everybody. Uh, this is the talk uh, on how to build a blockchain. Uh, we're going to build today a little mini cryptocurrency in Ruby. Uh, and uh, that right there is me. It's actually a more handsome version of me, but uh, I thought I'd put it there anyway. Um, so I, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I assume most of you know who I am, but some of you certainly won't. Uh, so I am Asif Qureshi, I'm a software engineer. Uh, I work at a blockchain company called 21. Uh, if you've never heard of it, you should go check it out, it's pretty cool. And uh, everything's fine, so, uh, that, so you can ignore that part. Um, okay, so you all came here to learn about blockchains. And uh, blockchain is like a really sexy word, and for whatever reason, everybody has come to conflate the terms cryptocurrencies with the term blockchain. Uh, and the thing is, uh, blockchain is kind of a red herring. And uh, what I mean by that is that uh, blockchain is not that important. It's one tiny little component of why cryptocurrencies work and what makes them so interesting and so powerful. Uh, but for some reason, people think that like, blockchain is the big deal. So if I sat here and like, showed you guys a blockchain, uh, you, you wouldn't get it. You have no idea why it mattered, and you have no idea why it enables anything that we weren't already able to do. Uh, and so I kind of used the word blockchain to lure you in here. Uh, but now I'm going to kind of tell you uh, about something a little bit more interesting. Uh, I'm going to tell you about blockchains too, but I'm going to tell you more about uh, what is it that makes building cryptocurrencies so hard. In order to really understand that, you have to start from first principles. Okay? And so that's exactly what we're going to do, and that's kind of the way that I'm going to structure this talk. Okay, uh, and just so everybody knows, this talk is scheduled to be about two hours, so it's going to be pretty long. Uh, I'm going to try to take a break in the middle, so you guys can, you know, uh, just take a breather and, and take care of yourself, whatever. Uh, but we're, the, the goal of this talk is going to be going from uh, the very, very beginning version of a digital currency to go all the way to what we might call a cryptocurrency. Okay, uh, that's going to be my goal, and uh, hopefully we're going to keep this all within two hours so you can uh, go home safe and sound. Cool? Does that sound good? Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's do it. So, uh, we're going to start by making money on the internet. Uh, and this, of course, is a, a time, old, uh, time old thing that people always love doing. Uh, so, how can we make money on the internet? Well, this problem, the formulation of this problem, uh, started with the cypherpunks. Okay, now who were the cypherpunks? 
Now, the cypherpunks were a group of, uh, they were a group of mathematicians, cryptographers, computer scientists, weirdos, geeks, paranoids, whatever you want to call them, uh, who were, were largely communicating with each other online in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, through mailing lists. And one of the most famous mailing lists was, was named cypherpunks, and that's kind of where it got its name. Um, and of course, it's a play off the term cyberpunk, which is a, a genre of kind of dystopian sci-fi. So uh, the cypherpunks had very particular beliefs that they all shared with each other uh, about the way they saw the world and the way they saw um, each other. So the... It's not casting slides. It's not casting slides. Okay, that's bad. Let's see if we can fix that. Uh, one second, everyone. Let me... I made it into the matrix. Okay. All right. Uh, let me know if we get slides back. If we get slides, then we should be good to go. Sorry, everyone. Uh, are, we, are they getting slides? Uh, yeah, uh, just clicked. Are we good? Yeah, there's, there's definitely going to be a bit of lag because it's streaming. It's, we're good. Okay, awesome. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, so let's keep going. So uh, the cypherpunks. Cypherpunks, okay. So uh, the cypherpunks, uh, they all had a shared set of beliefs that they, that they uh, uh, talked to each other about on this mailing list. And so one of these strong beliefs was uh, libertarianism. Okay, so the cypherpunks, they deeply distrusted centralized institutions. And they believed that uh, people should be free from the tyranny of governments. Okay, so they, they didn't trust states. They didn't trust centralized authorities. They thought there was, there was some corruption inherent in almost anything centralized or anything sufficiently uh, powerful. And so they, they, they wanted to get away from that. And they believed that uh, in the digital age, information is going to be power. Okay, and so in order to protect yourself against the state, uh, you needed to ensure privacy. Privacy meant that the individual was sovereign over their own information, which also meant that the individual was sovereign over the state or the government. Okay, and uh, so how do you protect privacy in, in a digital world? Uh, well, the way you protect privacy is with cryptography. And cryptography is the mathematics of encryption, among other things, mathematics of codes more properly. Uh, but this was a cypherpunk's principal defense was the mathematics of cryptography. Okay? So, uh, you know, the cypherpunks, they, they congregate online, they created all these, you know, cool websites that were very cutting edge back in the 90s. Uh, and uh, there, was, there was one particular document written by Eric Hughes uh, in 1993 called the Cypherpunk Manifesto. And uh, in this screed he wrote uh, on privacy, he wrote, uh, privacy is necessary for an open society in the electronic age. We cannot expect governments, corporations, or other large faceless organizations to grant us privacy. We must defend our own privacy if we expect to have it. And he said, cypherpunks write code. We know someone has to write software to defend privacy, and we are going to write it. So if you want to build a community free from the state, uh, what do you need? Well. First and foremost, you need digital money. Uh, if you want to have an economy that is, that is uh, distinct and separate from the economy of the state and of governments, uh, then you're going to need some, some way to transact in that economy uh, outside of the world of, of fiat currencies or state-backed currencies. Um, so yeah, actually, if we could just <laughs> diddly the lights a little bit so people can see on the stream. Cool, all right. So uh, we're gonna need digital money, right? Uh, regular money is not gonna do the trick. So, uh, step one, replace money. This shouldn't be too hard. Uh, so why don't we uh, code up a currency? How, how does that sound? All right, let's do it. Okay, here we go. We're going to write up a currency. Okay, so uh, this, this shouldn't take long. Um, all right, so here's what I'm going to do. Uh, so right here I have a little Sinatra app. Okay, so if you haven't seen Sinatra, it's like a little miniature version of Rails. Super simple to just get a, a web app up and running. Uh, and so my currency is going to have three methods on it. Okay, uh, there's going to be get balance to get the balance of somebody who has my currency. Uh, you, can, you can post to the user's endpoint to create a new user uh, in case someone new wants to transact in our currency world. Uh, and then finally, you can transfer. So it's a transfer, you take a from and a to and an amount, uh, and the transfer goes through provided the, the transfer is valid. Okay, so uh, this shouldn't take long. This sounds pretty easy. So the way I'm gonna do this is I'm just gonna have this global variable that's gonna store my state, okay? Uh, and I'm gonna call this balances. And to start off with, uh, the only person who's gonna have a balance is me. Uh, that's why I called it Haseeb coin, is because I made it, and so I get to give myself a lot of Haseeb coin. So uh, I'm going to start off by uh, putting Haseeb as the first user, and he's going to have uh, one, let's say, one million Haseeb coins. Okay? That's unfair? It doesn't matter. I'm making it, so whatever. Uh, live with it. Okay, so uh, those are the balances. So in order to get somebody's balance, 
Uh, this should be pretty easy. You just like grab the user out of my balances map, uh, and then you check the balance, right? So that shouldn't be hard. Uh, so what I can do is I can just say, uh, I'll say uh, user equals params user. That'll grab the user that uh, you pass in in the, uh, in the get request. Uh, and then all I got to do is say balances uh, user. And I'll just print that in a string. And so I'll say, uh, I'll say uh, user has this balance. And that string will just be what gets returned by the get request. OK, so that'll tell you your balance. Great. Uh, now, to create a user, that's, that's pretty easy. Again, uh, just taking a name. So I say name equals params name. OK, and then I'm just going to say balances name uh, or equals 0. I want to make sure that it's not equal 0. Otherwise, you could like, overwrite somebody and give them a 0 balance. I don't want that bug. Uh, and then I'm just going to return, let's say, an OK, just to let you know. Cool, got it. You have created this user. Uh, now for the transfer. So the transfer is like the trickiest part. i got to make sure transfers work correctly. Otherwise, somebody can go in and hack my currency. OK, so uh, how am I going to do these transfers? Well, in order to do a transfer, uh, first thing i got to do is i got to get all three of the parameters. So I'll say uh, from two equals params dot values at uh, from and two. And I want to downcase both of these to make sure that uh, there's no like name uh, 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 casing problems. Uh, and then I'm going to grab the amount. I'll say amount equals params amount. Convert that to an integer. OK, and uh, now what I've got to do is i got to make sure that this transaction is actually valid. And uh, for now, I'm not going to check that like the, the uh, users are there. That's kind of a, you know, it'll just throw an error, in which case I'm fine with that. Uh, but I want to make sure that the amount you're transferring is valid, uh, which in order to do that, I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah, let me, let me, uh, let me do that. There you go. Uh, to make sure that the amount that I'm transferring is valid, uh, what I need to do is I need to check, uh, I'll say raise uh, unless uh, the balance balances uh, from is greater than or equal to the amount you're trying to transfer. Right? Otherwise, you can just transfer arbitrary amounts to someone. Uh, cool. So then now all I got to do is at this point say uh, balances from uh, minus equals the amount balances to plus equals the amount. Uh, and then at the very end, I'll just uh, return OK to let you know that the transfer was successful. Cool. So that should implement a transfer. And now, now this is going to be a little bit hard for me to actually see what's going on when I'm running a server. Uh, so I'm just going to do uh, this thing real quick. I'm just going to uh, put uh, balances dot, uh, to string and convert it to yellow using colorize. Uh, and I'm just going to put this in every single method. That way I can kind of see what's going on with my server as I'm running it. Okay. Uh, now, last thing, I have this client that I've written up that should help us query my, uh, my server. And so all this does, it uses this Faraday gem to just send post requests uh, and get requests to each of these methods for me. Okay, so all it's doing is it's sending an HTTP request to my server, assuming that it's on port 4567. Cool? We all satisfied with that? Okay. Let's, uh, let's run this. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into stage one, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and run the seed coin. So a seed coin is up and running. There's my server. Uh, and now I'm going to load up the client. I'm going to load client.rb. And using this client, I can send requests uh, to the server. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get the balance, get balance of Haseeb. And I can see here Haseeb has this amount of money. OK, great. Uh, now probably what I do is create a user. Uh, so who wants some Haseeb coin? Who wants some Haseeb coin? Yeah? Uh, name. What's your name? Jerry. Jerry. All right. Jerry's going to get some Haseeb coin. Uh, so how do I do that? Uh, create user. Uh, Jerry, let's see. Uh, let's see if uh, nope. So something broke. Uh, sorry, Jerry. No seed coin for you today. Um, let's see here. So bal ah, right, so we need an S and balances. Okay, so balances. Uh, there we go. That should do it. So we got to restart the server, uh, and let's clear that. Okay, and then let's create Jerry again. And now we got Jerry. Jerry's okay. We've got uh, we got me and Jerry got some money. And so now I'm going to transfer Jerry some money. Uh, how much money do you guys think Jerry deserves? <laughs> Five? Okay, I heard someone say five, so we're going to go to transfer five. So I'm going to transfer from Haseeb to Jerry, and I'm going to transfer five. Uh, and there we go. Now we can see Haseeb has this much, Jerry has that much. All is good in the world. Uh, we've, got, we've got money. Yeah. All right. That's it. We did it. All right. Thanks for coming, everyone. It was really great having you. Any questions? Any questions? Uh, how much is it worth? It's not worth any. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm shutting off a seed coin as soon as I leave the room. Uh, all right. So a seed coin's dead. Sorry, Jerry. Uh, your money is worthless. Uh, but you know, I don't know. It was it was a good ride. Uh, okay. So uh, that's the seed coin. Um, that was uh, that was pretty good. Um, it had a few problems. It had, it had a few issues. Uh, so what do you guys think some of the issues were with the seed coin? What do you guys? 
Sorry? There's no blockchain. There's no blockchain. Well, there's no blockchain. Uh, well, that's not really a problem. That's more of a, it's like not enough buzzwords going on in this currency, but I think that's, you know, that's, that's fine. A lot of currencies don't have blockchains. It has uh, no value. It's still running. It has no value. Well, okay, that, I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> like, it has value. If we agree it has value, I think it's pretty valuable. I feel like, I, I feel like you guys learned a lot from it. That was valuable. Um, but what are problems, like, if you wanted to use this currency to transact in the real world, what would be problems with the way that we built this currency? Yeah? Yeah, maybe not everyone's on the same system, so we have to create accounts for everyone. That's kind of cumbersome. But we could make it so that you don't have to create an account. When you like transfer, it automatically defaults your balance to zero. So we could solve that problem. But that's, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, yeah, what's another problem? That file gets destroyed, we don't know. It's true. Everything lives in memory right now. We're not using a database. Uh, so if we had like a centralized database, then, then you know, things would be actually persistent. Uh, but you point out if someone destroyed our file, then everything would be gone. right? So there's one point of failure, single point of failure. If, if this one thing goes down, everything's gone. Um, we've got some other more serious problems, though. Yeah, uh, over there. Uh, yeah, you can just reset your balance to whatever you want at any time. How can I reset my balance to whatever I want? How can I do that? How can I print money? What's that? Can you take it from someone else? Well, that's the thing. I can impersonate anybody else, right? All i got to do is say from, to, an amount. And then, boom, I get, I get other people's money, right? So there's no, there's no authentication. There's no way of saying, like, yeah, I actually, I, Hasib, actually want you to send all my money to, to Rachel, right? It just automatically, you know, someone just says, yeah, send money, and the money gets gone. Uh, so these are, these are pretty big problems. Uh, this is not, not going to be a workable currency. Uh, so the major problems were, one, most obviously authentication. Anybody can control anyone's account. This is totally untenable, okay? However, we can solve this problem. Uh, and there's like a very classical way to solve this problem. Uh, and so what we could do is we could have, like, this big hash map in here called passwords. Okay, this is what a lot of centralized services do. Uh, and we could say, you know, Hasib, his password is Hunter12. Okay, uh, we, could, we could do that if we really wanted to, right? And that, would, and that would work. I mean, maybe we don't want this in plain text. Maybe we want to use some fancier crypto, right? But fundamentally, this would solve the problem, wouldn't it? This would solve the problem. Uh, because now, not everybody can just steal anybody else's money. So, uh, so that's, that's fine. We can solve this problem with passwords for the moment. Okay, just grant me that, that passwords would solve this. Um, now, we do have the availability reliability problem. Uh, so one version of that is that if the server goes down, no more money. Okay, if you want to pay someone five a seed coin, too bad, server's not responding. You know, so uh, you're going to have to find some other way to buy your drugs or whatever you're doing with a seed coin. Uh, so that's, that's, that's kind of crappy, right? Like an economy, in order for it to work, it's got to always be around, right? We don't need to be pinging a server to make sure that we, you and I can exchange a few dollars, okay? Uh, but the second problem, of course, is that if the government kicks down our, you know, if the FBI comes and kicks down my door and goes and finds the server I'm using to run a seed coin, uh, then suddenly the whole currency's gone, right? No more seed coin for anyone. Uh, or if I just become insolvent, if I get too poor, I run out of money, like my electricity bill isn't getting paid, then boom, everything's gone, no more receive coin. Or if I just get bored of all of you, and I'm like, you know what, I don't like you people that much anyway, you know, screw all you and your receive coin trade, and I just shut it off, uh, then you're all screwed, right? No more, no more economy. Uh, and that's no good. That You can't build an economy unless you can have total reliability on uh, your, your medium of exchange, uh, meaning your currency. And so finally, we do have a security problem, which somebody else also pointed out. Um, so if anybody successfully infiltrates the server, they can take all the money, right? Uh, that's pretty bad. Uh, and so who could successfully infiltrate the server? Well, for one, me, right? I could just go, I, I could go in here and I could say, uh, yeah, Hasib, uh has that much. And then, uh, you know, bad guy uh, gets another, you know, da-da-da-da-da. Or I could have like an endpoint that's like, you know, print more money for Hasib. And I'm the only one who can hit it, and I keep hitting it, and I keep printing more money, and suddenly, like this whole currency is just totally defaced, right? It's not, it's not really a currency anymore. So uh, these are all pretty serious issues, uh, and so the cypherpunks knew that uh, people suck. Okay, you can't trust people. You can't trust anyone. All right, uh, people, if they have power, they are going to abuse it. All right, uh, and this, this not only includes government, but includes almost everybody. And so the the centralized, the problem then is that centralized systems are no good. Even if you have one really, really awesome person in the middle of that centralized system, uh, you can't trust them. You can't trust them not to get arrested. You can't trust them not to, uh, you know, uh, go back on you or betray you. You can't trust them to not just be idiots and do something stupid, okay? You can't trust a centralized system. So, uh, how can we avoid a single point of failure? Well, uh, simple. You can just kill the server, okay? So, how can we kill the server? 
And this brings us to decentralized protocols. So uh, what we want to do is we want to go from this architecture. Okay? This is the architecture we have right now. We have one server, and everybody who wants to exchange in some of seed coin, they talk to this centralized server. Okay? So anybody who says, hey, what's my balance? They talk to my server. They say, hey, transfer that my server does all the work. Right? We want to go from this kind of architecture to this kind of architecture, known as a gossip protocol. Okay? In a gossip protocol, everybody talks to each other, but there's no central person that controls the protocol. Okay? Everybody sort of talks to each other, and that's how they decide what the current state of the system is. So in a gossip protocol, uh, there's no leader. What that means is that everybody is equal, but it also means that everybody is equally replaceable. So if any individual goes offline or gets kicked off or the FBI comes in and steals their machine or, or you know, puts them in prison, uh, the system, the network can still function. It still goes on without them. People still keep gossiping and the state still persists. Uh, and then, so okay, if you have a gossip protocol, how do you actually get plugged into the protocol? Well, what happens is that uh, if you want to enter into a gossip protocol, kind of like if you want to enter into a social group, right? How do you learn what all the good gossip is? Well, you find somebody and they tell you all the good gossip, right? They're like, oh man, Cheryl did this thing and then you know, John said this to her and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so in the same way in, an, in a gossip network, what you do is you connect to at least one peer who's a part of the network, and they're like, oh, uh, that guy, that guy, and that guy over there, they're also parts of the network, so uh, you should go talk to them too, and then those people will tell you, ah, oh, you should go talk to these people, and now suddenly you've been connected to this web of people. But to do that, you only need to connect to one person somewhere along that, uh, that gossip network. And then finally, you know, unlike with a centralized server, a, a gossip protocol is eventually consistent. Okay? What that means is that there's no uh, like time-sliced... Well, another way to say this is that when we send a transaction, when we send a message in a gossip protocol, what we do is we tell our peers. Right? And so I say, hey, uh, I want to do this. Hey, I want to do this. Hey, I want to do this. Okay. Well, it takes a while for that gossip to get to the other side of the room. Because right? there are a lot of people in the middle. And over there on the other side of the room, someone might say something as well. And that takes a little bit of time to get over here. And so basically these, these messages kind of permeate the network slowly and kind of like propagate over time. Uh, what that means is that messages might take a while to get from point A to B. Uh, and so we just gossip to one or two of our peers and we trust that it floods through the network. And this is a process often known as flooding, uh, which is the way that you send messages kind of to everybody in your network. So uh, that's a gossip protocol. Uh, why don't we code one up and see how it works? Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and kill the seed coin. That was great. Uh, good time with the seed coin. Uh, let's start uh, gossiping. Okay, so this gossip protocol, it's going to be, uh, we're going we're gonna to deviate a little bit from currencies just to make this simpler to understand. Okay, so what we're going to do instead of currencies is we're going to gossip about our favorite movies. Okay, does that sound good? Everyone here likes movies? I assume. Yeah. Movies, movies are good. Okay, so I've got here a list of a bunch of movies. All right, uh, these are like, uh, I don't know, the top. Something, something movies on something, something. I don't know. They're good movies, supposedly. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to load all these movies uh, into memory, and everybody who's part of this gossip protocol is going to pick a favorite movie. Okay? And then using the gossip protocol, I want to figure out what everybody's favorite movie in the network is, but I only want to do it connecting to one person. Okay? So I'm going to have a bunch of people in the network. They're all going to talk about their favorite movies, and then slowly but surely, they're all going to come to understand what everyone else's favorite movie is. Okay? So that's my goal, but I'm going to make it a little bit trickier, okay? And the tricky part is that people's favorite movies are going to change over time, right? Naturally, your tastes change over time. Uh, and so you might start with one favorite movie and say, you know what? That movie sucks. I really like this movie instead, okay? That sounds good? That's the goal. We all on board? Okay, let's do it. All right, so uh, here's what's going to happen. So when I call this, uh, when, I, when I run this, uh, uh, this process, I'm going to pass in two command line arguments. One is going to be my own port, the port I want uh, this process to run on. Uh, and the second is the port that I want uh, my peer to be on. So the first peer I'm going to connect within the network. Okay? So uh, the port, you know, we say like localhost 3000, this is going to be like localhost 1234, and then, you know, 2345, 5, 6, 7, 8, whatever. Whatever the ports are, that's how I'm going to communicate with, the, with these different processes. Okay? But they're all going to run on my, my machine. So the first process is not going to have any peers. Because it's the one bootstrapping the network, right? It's the first person. So uh, that person is going to have uh, a nil peer port, okay? But everybody else is going to have at least one peer they connect to to get into the network. Does that make sense? So that's like, that's like your person who plugs you in. Okay, so uh, this sets the port. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to store the state, okay? The state is going to be basically like everyone's favorite movies. I'm going to store everyone's favorite movies in this big hash map. Uh, it's a thread-safe hash map because I'm going to be using multiple threads to make sure that this uh, thing works uh, 
as a server, uh, and so I need multiple threads to do that. So uh, that's just going to be a big hash map. You can kind of visualize this uh, like so, and I'm going to kind of show you what's going on with the state over time. Okay. So uh, I have this method written called update state. I'm going to show you it really briefly. Um, so uh, these are just like some little helper things that I've written. Um, so this method right here, update state, basically what it does is it updates the hash map according to some rules. Okay, and you don't need to worry about the rules too much. Just worry, just know that the rules are pretty intelligent and they're pretty much going to do what I want, so I don't have to worry about error handling uh, while I'm typing this stuff up because I, I don't want to deal with those details. Cool? So update state just updates the hash map. Groovy? Okay. So, uh, so here's what I'm going to do. So the first thing I've got to say is my own port, right now my state is nil and my peer port state is nil, uh, but all of, the, all of the ports that I know, so let's say I know like three people, I need to make sure that they're all uh, ports, their keys in my hash map. That's how I know who my peers are in this network. Okay, so I have them and then I have their state. So their favorite movie, their favorite movie, and their favorite movie. Okay, that's what my hash map's gonna look like. Cool? Okay, so uh, awesome. So what I'm gonna do is uh, grab all these movies. So this is reading the file, uh, parsing it, grabbing all these movies line by line. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab my favorite movie. So my favorite movie, I'm just gonna pick one at random. Okay, so my favorite movie for now is gonna be movies.sample. Right, I'm just gonna pick one randomly. Uh, and I'm also gonna add a version number. Okay, I'm going to explain in a moment why I need a version number, but for now I'm just going to make it zero. Okay? And then I'm just going to say my favorite movie, now and forever, is favoritemovie.green. Okay? Because I said so, because. Okay. Uh, and so then I'm just going to update my state, and uh, I'm going to update my state with my favorite movie and my version number. Again, I will explain why the version number in a moment. Okay, so now I, all I want to do at this point is just render the state every three seconds so you guys can see what's going on. Okay? Uh, so let's go ahead and run this. So let's go into stage two uh, and let's run the gossip protocol. And you can see here I picked Sunset Boulevard as my favorite movie. And every uh, few seconds it's going to print uh, nothing because why is it not printing anything? Uh, render state. Uh, let's see here. Update state. Do, do, do. Uh, port favorite movie and version number. Interesting. Okay. Doesn't seem to be printing anything. Uh, I do have a favorite movie. So let's. Real quick, let's uh, <laughs> acquire Pry and get in here, see what's going on. Live coding, everybody. This is going to be fun. All right, so in a, in a few seconds, this should jump into Pry, and we can take a look at the state. Uh, the state is empty for some reason. So why is the state empty? Uh, oh, because it didn't pass an import number. That's why. OK, uh, cool. So good thing I was paying attention. Uh, all right, so I got to pass a port number that I want this to default to. So I'm going to say, hey, you should run on port 1111. Okay, uh, and so now it knows that it runs on port one 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 one, and so every few seconds it's going to print out its own state. Uh, this is me, of course. This is, I'm I'm one 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 one, and I currently like Kill Bill. Okay, cool. All right, so uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it that every few seconds I, I change my mind about which movie I like. All right, because I'm I'm very uh, I'm just one of those people. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is to say uh, puts um, uh, you know what screw a favorite movie dot yellow. It's so cliche. Okay, uh, and so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a new favorite movie, okay? So my new favorite movie is going to be, uh, a favorite movie is a, a new movie. I'm just going to sample the movies again. Uh, I'm going to implement, implement, sorry, increment my version number. Uh, and then I'm going to put uh, my new favorite movie is uh, uh, favorite movie, favorite movie, uh, dot green, because that's much better. I'll make this red. Okay, and so now you can see that uh, every eight seconds it's going to uh, repudiate its old movie and decide on a new movie that it loves. So for now it likes Gran Torino, uh, which is uh, obviously a subpar movie, but Der Untergang is, uh, is much better. Uh, it didn't update though because I didn't update state. So I got to make sure to do that. Uh, update state, uh, and I want to say myself, the, my, my port is port, uh, and again, favorite movie uh, and the version number. Okay, so uh, awesome. So I've got this working now. It's, it's changing its mind about movies, uh, but there's no gossiping going on yet. That's kind of problematic. Uh, so I want to make it gossip with people. Okay? Now, how do I make it gossip with people? Well, uh, now, to, in order to understand that, first you have to understand what this version number is doing. Okay? So in a, in a gossip protocol, remember, messages are just kind of traveling through the network. Right? It's like you might say something, it might go over there. You might say something to another partner over there, it might go over there. Uh, and like a message might take a while to come and rope back around and get to me. Right? This is very possible in a peer-to-peer -peer network. And I want to know when I hear two messages from you, which one was sooner. So if I hear that you liked Gran Torino, and then someone else will be, ah, he liked Dan, Der Untergang. Is that what it's called? Der, Der Untergang? Whatever. Uh, if, if, I, if I hear that you like that movie, well, how do I know which of those two I should update to say, like, ah, that's what you currently like? Right? I need to know, like, an auto-incrementing number, 
for, ah, oh, this is the most recent movie that you like, so I can ignore an older message, right? That's why I need the version numbers. So with the version number, I can decide, okay, hey, I'm getting a message from this person. This is newer than the old message they gave me, so I'm going to update my state with that message, okay? So here's what I'm going to do. Every few seconds, I'm going to connect to each of my peers, and I'm going to ask each of my peers, hey, uh, what's, what's going on? What do you like right now? Uh, but not just that. I'm also going to ask what they've heard from everybody else. Okay? So when I gossip with you, I don't just say, hey, what's your favorite movie? I also ask you, hey, what is everyone's favorite movie that you know? Okay? And then using all that information, I'm going to update my own state so that I know what all the favorite movies are that other people know. Cool? Okay, so let's do that. So what we're going to do is every three seconds, uh, and this is just like a little helper I wrote that's going to you know, spawn a thread and do something every few seconds. Uh, every few seconds, I'm going to iterate through all of my peers. Okay? And so each of the peers are going to be state. Uh, I'm going to duplicate it so I don't get any, uh, uh, any uh, concurrency issues. Uh, and I'm going to iterate through each key. And this is going to be a peer port. Okay? So for each peer port, uh, I want to gossip with them. Okay? Uh, and I'm going to just say here, puts... Uh, Gossiping with uh, peer port. Gossip, gossip. Okay, uh, just so I can see that this gossiping is going on. Uh, and uh, let's also uh, let's say this. Let's uh, next if peer port is my own port because I don't want to. I don't want to gossip with myself because it's not going to make any sense. Uh, so I'm going to gossip with everybody else. So to gossip with everybody else, uh, I've got this nice handy dandy little client right here that I've also written uh, that has this gossip method. Okay? And it's just going to hit the gossip endpoint. Uh, I haven't written the gossip endpoint yet, but for now, I'm just going to pretend it does what I want. Okay? So the gossip endpoint is going to return to me their state. I'm going to pass it my state. They give me their state. We're gossiping. Right? We're trading info. So, uh, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say uh, client.gossip. I'm going to pass in the peer port, and I'm going to pass in my state. Uh, but they can't, uh, they can't read my state. So in order for them to get my state like as a Ruby hash map, uh, I'm going to turn it to JSON. Uh, so I'm going to json.dump it. That will turn into a string. That way I can send it down the network. Okay? Uh, cool. So what I should get back from this is their state. So I'll say uh, their state equals uh, this. And so uh, they're going to send me a JSON encoded string as well. Uh, I've got to parse it. So I'll say, uh, here's what I'll do. I'll just say update state, uh, json.parse their state. And so now, now update state, uh, I told you, is going to just resolve, it's going to resolve any conflicts for me. Okay, so if they have like a nil value or if they have an older message than what I want, uh, this logic right here, it's kind of a mouthful, so I'm not going to go over it. Uh, this logic just resolves all that. Okay, so make sure that I only get, I only update the most recent message. Okay, so cool. So that should be, that should handle all my gossiping. Uh, and then at the end of this, I want to render state. So every time I'm done gossiping, I want to show what my current state is. And now finally, let's actually do the gossiping part. So to gossip, remember what happens. I get in state. I update my state with what they told me, and then I give them my state. Right? Very simple handshake. Right? So here we go. Uh, param state is going to be their state. So I'll say their state equals that. Uh, then I'm going to update state with json.parse their state, uh, their state. Uh, and then I'm going to return my state. Uh, but in order to do that, again, I have to json.dump it so that they have it in a JSON format so they can read it. Cool? OK. So I think, fingers crossed, this should work. Let's see if it does. OK, so uh, what I'm going to do, let's get these bigger. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start by seeding the network with this guy. OK, this guy is going to be the first node. Uh, and they're going to be 1111. All right? uh, and there we go. And they like Annie Hall. Uh, great, it's a good movie. OK, so uh, now I'm going to go over here. And I'm going to run the gossip protocol. And I'm going to have a new port. I'm going to have port 2222. OK, but I'm going to connect to my peer 1111. And let's see if they synchronize. Here we go. Oh, nope. Uh, we got a problem. Uh, let's see what happened here. Uh, the problem is uh, param. I wrote params instead of param. Ah, come on. OK. Uh, that is the problem. I wrote param instead of params. Uh, let's kill this guy. Let's restart. Again, connecting to port 1111. Uh, and let's see if we can get the two of them to talk. There we go. They are now synchronized. And so you can see that both of these ports are reporting the same films. Uh, and if I make this bigger, you guys can see, there we go, they're gossiping with each other, you can see the messages, right? Pretty cool. Let's see if we can get a third part, third one going. Let's make it a party. Uh, so, Ruby gossip, 3333, three, three, three. we're going to gossip now with 2222, two, two. okay? I'm going to gossip with that, but not the original. I'm going to gossip with the last peer, uh, and then let's get one more going. Uh, make it a foursome, and uh, gossip, <laughs> no, uh, no. Uh, and there we go. Now we've got four people gossiping with each other. Uh, entirely through a gossip protocol. 
And you can see them, they all know what each other like uh, in terms of movies. Okay? Now, there's, there's only one problem with this gossip protocol. Well, there are a million problems, but one of them that I'd like to point out uh, is that if somebody wants to leave the network, let's say somebody is like, man, I'm tired of talking about films all the time, uh, they might leave the network. Uh, and then everybody else uh, just kind of breaks. So they're like, oh man, what happened to three? They, were, they had such a great movie. Uh, and now everybody, no one wants to talk anymore. Three is like kind of a total buzzkill, uh, and everybody else doesn't want to talk. So that's, that's no good, right? You want, you want a friend group that's going to persist when someone leaves. So uh, in order to do that, what's happening is that we're getting an error right here. Uh, it's not able to connect to this person, and so this, this error is bubbling up. So here's what we'll do. We'll, we'll begin here. We'll wrap this in a begin block, uh, and we'll rescue the error. So if we have a Faraday uh, connection fail error, then uh, what we'll do is we will, uh, let's just, it puts the error, and then we will go in and say, okay, this, person, uh, this person's gone. We'll just delete them from our peer group, okay? Uh, which is always what you do when someone stops talking. Uh, let's see here, uh, peer port. Okay, and so now, if all goes well, we should be able to have four people, once again, gossiping. Uh, but now if somebody leaves, everybody else should still be able to gossip. So let's see, uh, let's see if we can get that working. Uh, so do we have everybody uh, gossiping? Okay, everybody's gossiping. Let's kill these two. So you're gone, you're gone. Uh, and there we go. We've got one and four continuing to talk. So uh, pretty cool. So now we have some gossiping going that's uh, resilient to people leaving the network. Pretty cool? Yeah. yeah. Okay, awesome. Gossip. You may clap. You may clap. I welcome the applause. Okay, all right, cool. Uh, so that was pretty neat. That was pretty neat. Um, so... Uh, all right, so gossip, cool, cool, cool. Okay, so uh, what was wrong with this? Let's talk about what's wrong here. So what was wrong? Uh, this, is, this is neat, right? You can gossip. Let's imagine we were gossiping about transactions and whatnot. Uh, what's, the, what's the problem with this? Yes? A middleman can lie. A middleman can lie, yes. A, a middleman slash woman can lie. That's, that's a problem, right? Uh, and how exactly could they lie? What's a lie you could tell in the system? I could tell them that your favorite movie is something that doesn't even exist. Exactly, exactly. So here's here's a potential attack that I could perpetrate in the system. Okay. Um, so uh, actually, let me let me first really briefly describe what I'm talking about when I talk about this kind of attack. So generally speaking, uh, when we want to build a strong system or a resilient system, we want the system to be what's called fault tolerant. Okay. Uh, and so what we've achieved with this gossip protocol, when we killed nodes and kept them alive, is we achieved fault tolerance. Okay, uh, and so fault tolerance means an individual node can fail or go offline or have a fault. A fault is basically when the node dies, uh, and the system stays up, which we saw because the two other parties got to keep gossiping, right? Uh, great. But we want a stronger guarantee than fault tolerance. Okay, if we're going to build a monetary system, we need more than just like, okay, you went offline, but we can still chatter. Okay, uh, we want what's called Byzantine fault tolerance. Okay, now a Byzantine fault is a fancy word for when an actor misbehaves by doing something arbitrary or, more likely, malicious, right? So basically, if somebody's up to trouble, if somebody's going to do something to intentionally fuck over our system, we want to be able to protect against that, right? Especially if you have a monetary system, uh, probably a lot of people are going to try to do that, right? So if you're thinking like a cypherpunk, and you know that people suck, then you know that we have to build a system that's going to work in spite of sucky people, okay? So uh, we want everything to work in spite of these bad actors. So we have this problem with authentication once again. So uh, the attack that you, that you mentioned was that someone could pretend that someone else said something they didn't, right? So here's one potential attack. Uh, you could say, hey, Hasib told me his state uh, that his favorite movie was Transformers. Uh, also, the version number was 9,999, right? Uh, and now anything that I say is not going to be big enough to be, be bigger than that version number, and now I'll never be able to take that back, right? Everyone's going to think that I'm, that I'm into Transformers. Uh, I've actually never seen the film, but I hear it's great. Uh, so how can we establish identity in this kind of system, okay? So before, remember what we did. Before, the way that we solved the identity problem was we used passwords, right? And so you have passwords, and you can log in, and that's how I know you're you. Um, however, passwords no longer work in a gossip protocol, okay? Why do passwords no longer work? Passwords no longer work because everything is out in the open, right? If we had a big password hash in the middle of this thing, uh, if we had like state had like you know uh, you know port one 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 and it's like your password or his password and then his favorite movie, anyone could just look at this password and be like, oh yeah, well his password is hundred twelve, so I'm going to say that yeah, hundred twelve transformers blah blah blah, right? If everybody has the state, nothing is secret, 
We cannot use open secrets like passwords in order to protect the system. Uh, so that is, is problematic. Now, there are potentially some ways around that. Uh, but fundamentally, this, this password problem is, is really bad. We, we don't want to use passwords in this way. Okay? Uh, now, one other idea that uh, some people have is that maybe we can use IPs. Right? Who thinks that this might work? No one, no one wants to participate. <laughs> it's someone, someone thinks this works. All right. Well, what do you guys think might be the problems with IPs? Why might IPs not work for this kind of system? Yeah, in the back. Sorry? They're dynamic. They're dynamic. Yeah, so IPs are not static. So I might have an IP one day, the next day my IP changes, uh, especially if I'm like on a mobile phone, my IPs can change all the time if I'm walking around. That's a problem. Uh, another problem with IPs is that uh, multiple people have the same IP, right? So if you and your twin brother, who's, uh, you know, very nefarious, uh, if you're both on the same family computer, okay, it's kind of bad if just from being this, at the same IP, they can transfer all your money and do all sorts of crazy shenanigans uh, and then, you know, tell on you to your parents. Or, I don't know, whatever. Um, depends on how old you are. Uh, so that, that's no good, right? IPs are not going to do the trick. The other thing is that IPs are easy to spoof, okay? So if you have, uh, so it, it, even with TCP, there's, there's a lot of ways to spoof. Uh, and you can use things like, uh, uh, you can use malware, you can use uh, uh, botnets and stuff like that to try to find an IP that's close enough that it's going to be a match. There's a lot of problems with IPs, okay? You don't want to use IPs. They're not a stable source of identity. So we need something else, okay? We can't use passwords. That doesn't work. Port numbers, obviously, even worse. Um, so what then? What can we use to build an authentication system in a gossip protocol? Face ID. Face ID. Yes, the answer is face ID. Uh, no. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use cryptographic identities. We are cypherpunks after all, so uh, that's the way we're going to do it. I see some people like trying to parse what this says. Uh, don't worry about it. Um, okay, so we're going to use cryptography. Uh, specifically, we are going to use a form of cryptography known as public key cryptography, also known as asymmetric encryption. Okay. Uh, there, there's also symmetric encryption. It's not what we're going to talk about today. So uh, the asymmetric encryption involves what are known as uh, uh, public and private keys. If you've ever heard this term, which you probably have, I'm about to explain to you what the hell that is. Okay. So in asymmetric encryption, what you do is you generate a pair of keys. One is your public key and one is your private key. Okay. A loose abstraction is you can think about your public key as being your username and your private key as being your password. Okay. Uh, you must keep your private key private, okay? It is a secret. If anyone, if anyone knows your private key, you are screwed. That is like your, that is your passport in the digital world, okay? Uh, your public key, however, should be published out in the open. Your public key is how people know you are who you are, all right? Uh, these keys effectively become your identity in the digital system. So with your private key, you can cryptographically sign a statement. Okay, uh, and for now, don't worry about what that actually means. Just know that there's some way, given a private key, that you can like create a signature over any arbitrary piece of text, okay, uh, or any arbitrary piece of data. Anybody who has your public key can use your public key to verify that your private key was in fact the signer, uh, and in fact they can use it to decode the message. Okay, so you encode something with your public key, or sorry, with your private key, and they can read it using your public key. Okay, uh, and that's how they know that it was sent by you. So uh, this signature is intractable to forge. There's no way to forge a digital signature, uh, or at least no way that we know of currently. Uh, Hand-waving away quantum computers for certain algorithms. Uh, so uh, it derives its power uh, from mathematical puzzles, okay? Specifically, puzzles that are easy to verify but hard to compute. Uh, so RSA, one of the most famous and one of the earliest asymmetric algorithms, uses uh, uh, factoring uh, integers. Um, other systems use discrete logarithms, elliptic curve relationships. Doesn't matter what that means, uh, but just to give you kind of a little bit of an intuition about what, how these puzzles might work. Uh, so RSA is actually uh, somewhat complex. It uses some modular arithmetic, uh, but you can kind of get a sense of the idea, right? Let's say you have two really big prime numbers, okay? So I have a huge prime number A and huge prime number B. It's pretty easy to find big prime numbers, okay? What I do is I multiply those two numbers together, and I get some enormous number that has exactly two factors, right? And those two factors are these huge long numbers. Turns out factoring a number into its prime factors is really slow. It's really hard to do, and we, know, we don't know any way to do it quickly. Okay? Uh, and that problem, where there's this asymmetry between, one, between the solution, and, or sorry, between uh, the, you know, sort of the, the product and the way you get that product, right? if I hide the two factors, I know the two factors, and I can very easily produce the, the, the big uh, uh, the, the product of the two of them. Uh, but just knowing the product is very hard to find the factors. Right? And so this kind of asymmetry is basically inherent in all these problems that allow you to create a public and private key. Make sense? Okay. So 
Uh, let's test it out. Let's just kind of go through a real quick test run and see how these algorithms might be used as sort of in practice. This is going to be just a little kind of a, a toy demonstration. Um, so let's, uh, let's take a look. So public-private key cryptography, it, it's often uh, abbreviated as PKI, which stands for Public Key Infrastructure. Uh, and I'm going to have a few methods here. I'm just going to walk through what these methods, methods do, okay, or these functions. So the first one is called Generate Key Pair. And the way you generate a key pair, you use the open SSL bindings in Ruby, uh, and you just generate a new uh, RSA key pair uh, with the required number of bits that you want. 2048 is pretty standard. Uh, so I'm going to create a key pair, and then I can extract the two of them using some methods on their interface. Uh, I export like in the PEM format, which I can use as like this big long string. So let me just kind of show you uh, what that looks like. So if I go into here, I load a pry, I load a pki.rb, okay, and uh, I'm going to generate a key pair. So generate key pair. Here we go. Uh, and there's my key pair. So you can see here, I've got the private key. It's this big, long thing. Private key is longer than the public key. Uh, and here's the public key. It says begin public key. Uh, and there's a bunch of garbage over there. Right? All, most of this just looks like total nonsense. Uh, but of course, this is just like an encoding of a bunch of random bits uh, into base 64. That's, that's all that this is. Uh, and this is a format that's used uh, kind of around the internet. So you might see this like, you ever you know, had like keys that you use like GitHub and stuff like that? This is exactly what you're doing. You're doing this. Um, cool. So I've got a key pair. And using the key pair, I can both sign and uh, I can both sign and then decrypt messages. Okay, so to sign something, uh, I grab. So you pass me the raw private key. That's like the PEM format private key. Uh, you pass me that private key. Uh, I put it back into the RSA format just by wrapping it in this thing. It automatically converts to a public and private key. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is just do this private encrypt method, which is just going to encrypt it using the private key, uh, and I'm going to encode it in base64, so it's not just a bunch of escape characters, uh, which it's very likely to be. So let's let's try that. So we'll say uh, private key uh, pub key equals that. So we, now we have the uh, the private key right here. Okay, that's our private key. And so now I'm going to sign a statement. I'm going to sign hello world. Okay, uh, and I'm going to sign it with my private key. And you can see here's the uh, signed message. Okay, signed message is that. Okay, great. So now I can retrieve the plain text, right? If I want to get the plain text from the signed message, basically meaning if I want to decrypt it, I just pass in the public key and uh, turn that into an SSL object or the RSA object, uh, deco uh, uh, decode the ciphertext back into the raw bytes, and then decrypt it, and I should have the plain text back. So let's see if that works. Plain text of uh, signed message, and then pass in the pub key, and I get hello world back, right? Easy peasy. So. What I want to write now is I just want to have a little method right here that checks if a signature is valid. Okay? So you pass me a message, you pass me the signed version of the message, and I can use this to prove that yes, this was the message you sent and you signed it. Right? Like I need both. If you just send me a signed message, I have no idea if like uh, if well okay, basically like if you send me a signed message and it wasn't signed by you, uh, or I, I don't know whose public key it is, I can't really ensure that uh, it's the thing that I'm looking for, right? But if you send me the real message and you send me the signed message, I can guarantee that, like, yes, this was the message that you sent me in that signature, right? And this is, in fact, your public key. Make sense? So here's what I'm going to do. Uh, so to check if a signature is valid, pretty easy. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the ciphertext, and I'm going to get the plain text version of it, right? That's the, that's the function that I just showed you that uh, decodes using the public key. Right? In order to get the plain text, I need to pass in the public key. Public key. That should give me the plain text. And all I gotta do is check that the plain text is equal to the message. And that will tell me whether it has a valid signature. Okay? So if I run this, whoops, uh, I just check valid signature with the signed message, or sorry, no, the uh, the uh, with hello world, the signed message, which is the ciphertext, and the public key, uh pub key. Pub key. Uh, cipher, oh, underscore. Need an underscore there. Or just remove the underscore here, I guess. Yeah. Let's try that again. Okay. Uh, and one more time. Play, whoops. What am I doing? Valid signature. True. Cool. So now using this, I can check signatures. Right? So you sign a message, you send it to me, and I can check, hey, yeah, you're really the person who wrote this. I can tell because you gave me your public key. I can tell that your private key signed this message. Right? And this is how I can prove that you are really the person who uh, owns that public key. Or sorry, who owns the private key corresponding to that public key. Does that make sense? We follow that? Cool. Okay. So now using this, I have a stronger notion of identity 
than I had before. Now I can use your public key rather than a password or any crap like that uh, to prove that you are who you say you are. So that's, uh, that's groovy. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, take a break here because it's, uh, it's been, been a little while. We'll take about five minutes. So we'll come back at 7.22. Uh, just you know, do whatever you got to do uh, and then we'll continue from there. Cool. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad you like it. I know you uh, you felt the spark of blockchain. Yes. I'm so sad you're not going to watch the whole thing. It's like, it wraps up super well. But I totally believe you. I didn't yeah. expect it was going to be two hours. It's two hours. I just talked to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are you posting on YouTube? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm going to watch it. So, everything's going to be on YouTube. So, why don't we just do a show about it? Yeah. Totally. Because yeah. I did one recently. Uh, Blockchain, like yeah, yeah, I saw it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's very, it was very simple, but it was like very similar to what I mean. This is basically you're doing, right? yeah. except I like the like you start with the gossip right. recipes right, right, right. stuff. Yeah. Which, by the way, I understand that stuff. <laughs> I understand where you're going with this. Yeah. Just because I don't understand gas doesn't mean I don't understand anything. Right. Like, I don't understand. Yeah. I don't, I don't right. know. No, no, I totally got it. Uh, yeah. Well, I thought you were good. And uh, it's. I was, I've been like up all night working on this thing. So I'm like, yeah. I've been like. Uh, it's good. It's really You're really entertaining. Glad to hear that. I feel like it's so long, though. I feel like people. Uh, I feel like the energy levels fluctuate. I don't know. It's in my head. You're doing a good job with yeah. the live coding. Thanks, man. Um, cool. Are there elements of this stuff that you don't understand at this point? Like, have you read through, the, like, when you go deep into the white paper, trying to stop the last part, like, I don't even know. Oh, there's definitely parts of, like, uh, there's definitely parts of systems that are uh, Like, I think all the basics and all the, like, the core of like, things I understand. Uh, there are some things that I don't understand, like, uh, I don't know, the lift curves I don't really understand. Uh, there's, like, a lot of stuff that's, like, uh, you know, uh, some of the deeper aspects of. Like, what do I want to say? Like, there's like inner blockchain stuff that I don't really understand. Like, five different blockchains talk to each other that I'm like a little bit rushing on about how those exactly work. But fundamentally, like, I feel that if you pour enough time into most of these things, they're all pretty understandable provided you know the So, you just know, like, if you can just get like blockchains, purple trees, networking, uh, and then like, you know, just some, uh, some game theory stuff, most of it is just like they built out of the purple I'm starting to get any ideas. Uh, no, I'm on stream right now. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Obviously, I don't want to go out my own ideas. Yeah, anyway. Uh, I'm going to grab people. Yeah, yeah. Let me do a quick wrap. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Thank <laughs> you. 
identities. So we figured out uh, how we can use public and private keys. Uh, and using public and private keys, which is this really awesome abstraction, uh, we can build a stronger notion of identity. We can build cryptographic identities. Okay? Um, and so with a crypt cryptographic identity, the idea is that you know, instead of thinking about your username or your port number or your IP or whatever, I'm going to think about your public key. Okay? And so long as I trust that only I'm going to trust it came from you, if you sign it with your private key, then now nobody can forge messages anymore. Okay? Uh, if uh, all signed messages that I receive, I can verify that they came from the person who owns that public key. Okay? There's no way to forge a message in, in, the, in the system. So we've gotten a lot already. We've talked about gossip. We've talked about public private keys. Uh, so are we there yet? Do we have enough for a currency? Um, well, it turns out we're actually most of the way there. Uh, we can do a lot with just what we got so far. Okay, uh, so in fact, we're already, we have most of the primitives, or a little bit more, but we have most of the primitives uh, that David Chom had when he created the first digital currency, which is known as DigiCash, okay? And David Chom is a uh, famous cryptographer and probably one of the forefathers of digital currencies, one of the very first people to innovate on this idea. So uh, you see, digital currency has a big problem that wasn't an issue for us uh, when we were dealing with movies, okay? Uh, and this problem is called the double spend problem, 
right? So here, let me give you an, an, an idea. So when we have, uh, when we're talking about movies, right? So I might tell you, hey, my favorite movie is, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, Blade Runner. Okay, and then I tell you guys over here that my favorite movie is uh, I don't know like some super arty you know uh, like Italian movie right because I'm trying to fit in with different friend groups and like whatever I'm just that kind of guy uh, and that's fine right with movies we kind of accept that it's not really a big deal uh, you can do that we don't really care okay it doesn't doesn't like hurt the system that you're kind of you know being duplicitous about your movies but with money this is a big problem okay if Let's say that I am this uh, wily uh, businessman, okay, and I have Alice and Bob over here in, in the corners, okay, and I want to transact with Alice and Bob, okay. Uh, if I have this receipt coin over here, and I want to give some receipt coin to Alice and Bob, here's what I can do. I can, I can sign the coin, okay, I can sign the transaction with the coin, and I can say, I hereby grant you, Alice, sole ownership of this coin. And Alice grabs the coin, she sees, yes, you've signed it, everything's real, I know it came from you, cool, in the rules of our currency, that's great. But then I do the same thing with Bob. And I sign the exact same coin and say, I hereby grant you Bob sole ownership of this coin. Uh, Bob receives the coin. And I do this at the same time. And let's say Bob and Alice are on different parts of the network. Okay, Bob is way over there. Alice is way over there. And they might, you know, talk to each other sometimes, but they're pretty far away from each other. Okay? So, as far as they both can see, uh, they've received some currency. And so they give me back. Uh, Alice gives me, uh, you know, a watch. And uh, Bob Ross gives me this amazing painting that he's painted by himself. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, very, uh, I'm very wily. I've managed to basically... Spend this coin twice, even though I only had one coin, right? And they will not be able to figure this out until later they go and try to spend the coin, and they realize they're like, oh, I, someone, that's not, that coin is not yours. It belongs to Alice. Someone told me that Alice spent that coin, right? Uh, and then somebody else on the other side of the network says, oh, no, Alice can't spend that coin. I heard that it got spent by Bob. Bob received that coin, right? And now suddenly there's a problem, right? Because our network is transacting in the outer world, and in the outer world, you receive the coin and you give me a real world object. Uh, well, I have the real world object now. You can't, you know, no, no take backs, right? Uh, no mulligans. So, DigiCash solved this problem by being centralized. Okay. So it said, out with the gossip protocol. We, that's not going to work. Uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a central bank. Okay. We're going to have a central bank, which is just one centralized server that sits at the middle of everything, and that server makes sure that there are no double spends. Okay. So. What that means is that if I send you some Aseeb coin, you go and you talk to that server and you say, hey, just want to make sure nobody else spent, Aseeb didn't spend this Aseeb coin to anybody else, did he? And the centralized server says, nope, he sure didn't. And then you can go and spend the Aseeb coin, right? Um, so uh, centralized server, you know, we solved the problem. We create a currency. It's probably, probably not too bad, right? No. DigiCash went bankrupt in 1998. And when DigiCash went bankrupt, all the DigiCash that anyone ever owned disappeared, right? The cypherpunks. We're onto something, okay? Um, they were onto something. Centralization is no good. The cypherpunks knew that for a digital currency to be stable and trustworthy, which a currency needs to be, it must be decentralized, okay? This is not a negotiable thing. Any currency that is centralized, provided that it is uh, not backed by a state, will eventually fall prey to one of these problems, okay? But in a peer-to-peer -peer network, how can you track and prevent double spends, right? It's part of the nature of a peer-to-peer -peer network that messages will slowly propagate, right? Something that happens over there and something that happens over there happen at different times. How do you solve this problem? This was for a very, very long time uh, the reason why it was so hard to come up with a digital currency. And for many, many years, there was this long winter after DigiCash, uh, after DigiCash went under and went bankrupt, uh, where people tried to find ways to solve the double spend problem, and nobody was coming up with anything. Nothing seemed to work. Uh, the double spend problem seemed intractable. Either you needed to just accept double spends and have a, you know, kind of a hocus pocus uh, uh, currency, or you needed some kind of centralization. There didn't seem to be any way to have both. Enter the blockchain. Whoops. Okay. Uh, all right, so in October of 2008, a pseudonymous individual by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, cypherpunk, produced a white paper in which he described a new protocol for a decentralized digital currency. He called this protocol Bitcoin. Now, what was Satoshi's key insight in the Bitcoin paper? The Bitcoin paper is actually quite short. It's about nine pages. Uh, you can, after this talk is done, you can probably read it and probably understand most of it. It's not, it's not too long. It's not too complicated. Um, Satoshi writes about a lot of things in that paper, but there's one particular key insight that he has uh, that ends up cracking the nut that had so long eluded the cypherpunks. See, double spends are problematic 
because we can't agree on timing. Okay, what do I mean by that? In a distributed system, or like in a peer-to-peer -peer system, which is a distributed system with a lot of different individual nodes, uh, there's no global ordering of all events. Now, what do I mean by that? So if Alice is over here, and Bob is over here, right, they both think that their span happened first, right, because they didn't hear about the other person's event happened. And of course, because events propagate slowly through the network, uh, no, you know, people don't know if thing A happened first or thing B happened first. How do we decide between them? Uh, there's no canonical timekeeper that we could use. There's no central authority that can say, yep, A happened, then B happened. Right? If A and B both think they happened at the same time, or if they think that they, one happened first before the other and they disagree, there's no way to resolve that dispute. And of course, people can lie about this. Right? They can lie and say that, uh, you know, if we just rely on people to report their own timestamps, uh, bad actors will just claim that their events happened first. Right? There's no way to prove a timestamp. How could you prove it? I, I say, okay, great. Here's my Unix timestamp. It's this number. I sign it. Great. Right? That doesn't prove anything. There's no way to prove that a thing happened at a particular time. Uh, and that's really problematic. So in order to prevent these double spending, right, we could, we could stop the double spend if only people could coordinate. If Alice and Bob could stop and talk to each other, and say, hey, uh, Bob Ross, do you, you end up getting a coin from a sieve? And you know, before anybody goes further in the chain of spending or, or giving anything back, uh, if they coordinate, then we'd be totally fine. Right? But we can't coordinate unless we slow things down. Okay? Everything right now is happening too fast for us to be able to coordinate effectively. So to prevent double spends, to summarize, we want to slow things down, we want to order all events, and we want to make it hard to change that order. Okay, what I mean by that, what I mean is that if we first agree that A happened before B, we don't want to later change our mind that like, oh, by the way, B happened before A, right? Kind of like in a gossip protocol, I can eventually change my mind that like, oh yeah, your favorite movie was Gladiator, oh, but somebody else told me your favorite movie was actually this, uh, and, you know, I changed the ordering because someone told me this happened earlier, right? I don't want to ever reorder things. I want things to like be in an order and then accept it and then be done with it, right? Otherwise, like, with money, that becomes a really big problem, right? So... In other words, if I want all three of these properties, what I want is what's called a decentralized timestamping server. Okay? So a timestamping server is like a server that takes in an event, smacks time on it, and moves along. And it says, great, this happened at time t. This happened at time t plus 1. This happened at time t plus 2. Right? I want that. And of course, in a centralized server, that's really easy. Right? It just reads off its clock, prints out numbers, and there you go. You have a timestamping server. Uh, but a decentralized timestamping server, that's quite a bit more tricky. Okay? How are we going to pull that off? So this is where Satoshi's key insight comes into play. And uh, it's known as proof of work, also known as Nakamoto consensus, which is named after him. Uh, he didn't call it that. Um, so what is proof of work? So Satoshi achieved these properties, the properties of a decentralized timestamping server, through cryptographic puzzles. Okay? So here's, what, here's the idea. You can't just send a message and have that message be accepted. Okay? The message has to be backed up by some computational work that you did in the form of solving a puzzle. Now this puzzle is really hard, and you can't fake a solution to the problem. You've got to really solve the puzzle, right? So imagine like Sudoku. Sudoku is really hard. We don't know any way to do Sudoku fast. Uh, so if you solve a Sudoku, that's definitely hard, right? We know that's hard, and uh, you can't really fake a solution to Sudoku because we can really easily check the Sudoku at the end to make sure it's a valid Sudoku. Um, now the solutions to these puzzles are known as proof of work. They're called proof of work because the solution proves that you did a bunch of work to find that solution, right? Uh, so basically, if you want to send a message, you have to do some work to send that message. And so basically, in the entire network, the next person who can find a solution to this really hard puzzle, so we're all like, we all want to talk, we're all trying to work on this puzzle, and one person finds a solution, and they get to talk. And then, the next, you know, then we're working on a puzzle, and the next person finds a solution, they get to talk, right? So... What did he use as his puzzle? The puzzle he used was uh, uh, using SHA-2 hashing. Okay? This is inspired by a scheme called Hashcash, uh, invented by Adam Back. So uh, if, if you guys remember what a hashing function is, a hashing function, uh, MD5 is one example, SHA-2 is what's used in, uh, in uh, Bitcoin. But uh, basically the idea is that you can take in any arbitrary data, uh, and it goes through your hashing function, it kind of garbles the bits, and it spits out just some random garbage. Okay? But that garbage is deterministic. Okay? So the same input always produces the same output, and even a slight change to the input changes the output completely. Okay? This is known as the avalanching effect. So just by changing one bit in the input, the output is completely different, uh, and using that, you can create a cryptographic puzzle. So what's the puzzle that he created? Well, the puzzle is this. So 
The puzzle is to find a nonce. A nonce just means like some value, any value you want. You just try different values until one works. Okay? The puzzle is to find a nonce which combined with your message produces a hash with some leading number of zeros. So let's say like three zeros. Okay? So you produce some random hash, right? So the random hash that you produce might be like that, da, 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 da. Okay? Uh, so let's, let's actually take a look at this. Um, so uh, let's take a look at proof of work. So uh, here we go. Let's see it in action. So here is a hash function. I'm just going to go ahead and paste this in a pry. Um, so here we go. So we've got uh, this hash function. Okay? And this just runs SHA-256 and spits out uh, some hash. Okay? So uh, let's hash um, just some random string. Okay? And here's what we get is the output. 6-E-E-4-D blah, 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 blah. Okay? Just some random stuff. And if I change you know, just one tiny little bit, I get a totally different output. Right? Okay. So the puzzle is that we want you to find uh, some random value which combined with your message. Let's say my message is, uh, message is hello world. Okay? That's my message. So what I, the puzzle that Satoshi invented is that I want you to take some uh, random nonce, actually I should append it to the end, um, take some random nonce that uh, paired with your message produces a hash with some number of zeros at the beginning, okay? So that is 1D, that's not even close, that's, that's nothing. Okay, that is a 3 at the beginning, that is a 2, uh, that is an A, that's an A, that's a 5, uh, that's the same thing, that's a, f okay, I got one zero. Great, that took a while, okay? Uh, to get four zeros is going to take a really long time. Uh, this, this talk is definitely going to go past two hours if I try to find four zeros, okay? So uh, we're going to speed this up by uh, writing a, a little function that's going to do this for us, okay? So we're going to try to solve this cryptographic puzzle using, uh, using some good old brute force, okay? So the idea of a hashing function, of course, is that it's one way. There's no way to reverse engineer a hashing function, otherwise it's considered to be weak. Uh, and SHA-2 we don't know to be weak, we consider it to be a strong hashing function. So we're going to try to find a nonce that works. Okay, so uh, here's what we do. I'm going to start off with some nonce, okay? Uh, what should our nonce be? Just some phrase. What's our phrase going to be? Pony. Pony, okay? So our nonce is pony. Actually, we might need a longer nonce because it might uh, get longer than that. So what's a longer nonce than pony? I love pony. I love pony. Okay, that's our nonce. Great. So I love pony. So what we're going to do is uh, we're, we're going to keep a count so we know how many times we're, uh, we're uh, 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 iterating to, to find this nonce. So we'll say until, uh, until valid nonce So until the nonce is valid, okay, uh, we are going to uh, find a new nonce. So we'll do just we'll just we'll just say this. We'll say nonce equals nonce dot next. This is a method you can use on a string to just like increment the string and make it uh, uh, like uh, lexicographically larger. So I'm going to keep iterating through this nonce, trying different nonces over and over and over again. Uh, I'm going to increment the count. Uh, count plus equals one. Uh, I'm going to put the count uh, and then return the nonce that worked. Okay. And so how do I know if a nonce is valid? Well, a valid nonce should be when you combine it with the message, right? So I'll do uh, nonce, or sorry, message comma nonce, message nonce dot join. I'm going to join the two together, and then I'm going to check if I hash this, uh, whoops, how many zeros does this start with? Okay, so I'll say uh, Ruby has a nice little method for this, dot start with uh, zero times the number of zeros. So for now, I'll say four. Four is the number of zeros that you're going to have to use. Okay, so uh, let's see if this does the trick. I'm going to go ahead and paste this in, uh, and let's try to find the nonce, find nonce for hello world. There we go. It took 107,000 iterations, and it iterated uh, uh, I love pony all the way up to I love VRAO. It tried every single combination in between, past, for the, changing the last letter, changing the second letter, changing the third letter, changing the fourth letter, all the way up to there, all the way up to VRAO to find that solution. Okay, so that obviously took a long time. Um, let's try this. Let's, uh, let's say if uh, count mod uh, uh, 100k double equals zero, then uh, puts a, just a period, so that we can see how many iterations it's going. And let's just increase this difficulty to five, right? And let's see, uh, let's see what happens. So let's put num zeros up to that. Let's uh, change the way the find nonce works. And uh, let's find nonce again for hello world. Uh, That is 100,000 iterations each. We've got 900k iterations, and we've got all the way up to the G, uh, iterating through each of those possible uh, characters. Okay? So that is a cryptographic puzzle. And uh, here we can actually we can print this, and we can just, just, to, just, to, just, for, just for yaks. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, say num zeros equals 6. Uh, let's also update this method. And let's find nonce again for hello world. And you can see here this one is going to take a while. 
because it's, I believe, a factor of 16 longer because we added another character in hex. So uh, that might be going on for a while, so let's check back in later. Um, uh, yeah, you have a question? Can we see what the hash looks like when it's done? Oh, yeah, totally. Let's see what the hash looks like when it's done. Uh, so it's going to return to us the nonce. Uh, here we go. Do, 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 do. Is it possible right. that it won't find one? Uh, it is possible, very unlikely, but possible. Uh, it's more likely it'll just be here all day uh, as it tries to iterate through, uh, you know, 16 to the something, uh, you know, how many characters is that? Uh, 16 to like to the 10th or 12th or 11th or something? Okay, so maybe let's go back to 5. Uh, I'm sorry, it's 5. Uh, let's, let's try to find a, a, a nonce a little bit faster. Uh, cool. All right. So I love trukada. Okay. So let's uh, let's do this. So it's I love trukada plus hello world. Actually, no. It's going to be reverse order. Hello world plus that. Let's hash all this, and there you see the five leading zeros that we found by computing this puzzle. Yeah. Okay. So this right here is what we mean when we say proof of work. Okay? So the proof of work is the proof that you did all the work to find that crazy ass nonce that combined with this message produces a hash with this many zeros. And the only way to do that is to just brute force, just keep trying different nonces until one of them works. Yeah, question? Yeah, and the reason that uh, it's a different solution every time is because the message tends to vary if I'm correctly. Yes, but uh, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um, so, uh, yes, so the reason why it's different each time is that the message will vary, and so for a different message, you'll get a different nonce. Um, okay, cool. So that is proof of work. That's hashing. Pretty straightforward. Makes sense. Um, so Satoshi called this process mining. Okay, so if you ever heard of Bitcoin mining, this is literally what they were doing. Okay, so you were taking some value and you were generating random nonces and hashing the, the thing plus the nonce to see how many leading zeros you could get. That's what Bitcoin mining is. Okay, uh, and so the tool you use to mine is your CPU. Right? That is literally your, your pickaxe when you mine is your CPU. Your CPU just keeps running through cycles and cycles or your GPU if you're getting crazy or your ASIC if you're even crazier. Um, so, so these mining puzzles are hard. Right? These, are, these are some pretty tough puzzles. Um, now, if, if you're paying attention, you might notice that uh, if I have a solution to a puzzle, can't I just show that solution to two people and still double spend? Right? So I've got the solution. I say, hey, here, here's the solution and the proof of work. Here's the solution and the proof of work. Um, yes, I guess I can. I didn't actually solve anything. I just slowed you down. Okay? So this is not the solution to the problem. Um, we've slowed things down, but we still have no global ordering on all events. Right? So even though I've proven that it's hard for me to you know, create a transaction, uh, I can still do both simultaneously. And there's no way to ensure that one happens before the other or decide whether one happens before the other. So for that we're going to need a blockchain. So a blockchain, now that you have all the ingredients, you can finally understand what a blockchain is. A blockchain is a sequence of these puzzle solutions. Okay? But the key is that the input to each puzzle includes the hash of the previous block or the previous puzzle. Okay? So what does that mean? So imagine we have this beginning block. Right? I, have the movie, I have the movie Gladiator. Okay? I have this hash that's got this leading number of zeros. Okay? In order for the next block to get appended to this blockchain, okay, you don't just grab your message and find some nonce that, that combined with your message that has some leading number of zeros. You also get the hash of the last block. Okay? So now these two, uh, uh, these two blocks are connected. They're connected because this hash will change every single block. Right? And so what you get is this chaining together of blocks that depend on each other. Right? You get this dependency between blocks. Right? And uh, this is, of course, why it's called a blockchain. These two blocks are chained together because their solutions involve a previous solution to a block. Okay? Uh, so the blockchain forces an ordering on each message because each message has a dependency on another message. If the messages depend on each other, they must be ordered, right? provided it's not a graph. If it's a, if it's a single list, then they must be ordered, okay? And with this ordering, you can get a blockchain. So uh, let's say we build one. Yeah? yeah. Let's build a blockchain? Yeah. About time? Okay, let's build, a, let's build a goddamn blockchain. All right, uh, so we're gonna build a blockchain, all right? So uh, here I've got some skeleton code for the blockchain. Uh, so here's the, the way I'm gonna use this. Uh, so I'm gonna start, we're just gonna use messages in this blockchain, okay? So I'm gonna start with a genesis block. This is often called what it's called for when you create the first block. Uh, and I'm gonna add three movies, 
uh, <laughs> Disney classics, because why not? Uh, so I'm going to add the chain Cinderella, the Three Stooges, and then Snow White. Okay? Those are going to be the three messages, and this is the API that I want for my blockchain. Okay, so cool. Uh, now the blockchain is going to have some blocks in it. It's going to be it's you know one uh, instance variable. And uh, when you create a new block, uh, what I'm going to do, or sorry, when you initialize a blockchain, I'm going to create the genesis block for you. Okay, so uh, here's what I'll do. I'll say uh, I'll pretend I have a block class, and I'll write the block class afterwards. Okay, so for for the individual blocks, I'll do that last. Okay, so I'll do a block. Dot, uh, I'll have a method called create genesis block. And I'll pass in the message for the Genesis block. Uh, and I'll say the blocks is an array that includes just the Genesis block. Okay? So uh, that's my blocks, and that should be good to go. Now, to add something to the chain, to the blockchain, uh, I need to uh, add it, of course, to this array that I have in memory. So I'm going to say add blocks, shovel in a new block, uh, and I'll say block.new. And let's say, so how do I want to build uh, my block constructor? So every block, if you look at uh, the blockchain we had before, every block needs to know the previous block. Right? That's its dependency. It depends on the previous block. Uh, so it has a previous block, a message, and then the rest it sort of generates by itself. Right? It gets its own hash, it gets its own nonce, but it computes that by itself. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass in the previous block, which is just blocks.last, that's the previous block at the time you push it in, uh, and then the message that you want to pass in there. Okay? Uh, and then I'm just going to shovel that into all the blocks. Um, and valid, uh, to check if a blockchain is valid, I'm going to do this last. Not worry about this for the moment because I don't really know how I'm actually going to validate the blocks themselves. I'll, I'll defer this for later. Okay, cool. So that's my blockchain, pretty simple. Uh, but the real logic is going to go in the block itself. Okay, the block is where the smarts of this thing is going to go. So let's write a block class. Uh, block. Okay, cool. So uh, a block class, def initialize. Okay, and like we said, it's going to take in a previous block and it's going to take in a message. Okay. So first things first, I'm going to say the message is the message, uh, and I'm going to add an add a reader on the message. And uh, so we've got a message. Uh, we also want to set the previous block. But there's one block that doesn't have a previous block, which is, of course, the genesis block, the very first block. So I'll say, uh, at a previous block, uh, well, so I don't need to actually store the previous block, because that's like not necessary. It'll be, it'll be really, uh, uh, I don't want like all the blocks to contain each other. But I can just store the hash of the previous block, because that's really the only thing I need. Right? I just need to know the hash of the previous block. So uh, I'm going to say, at, uh, at previous block hash equals, Previous block dot, uh, uh, I'll call it block hash. I don't want to call it hash because that's a built-in Ruby method that'll like, if I overwrite that, it'll break sets and hash maps and stuff. Um, cool. Uh, and uh, then, so I have the message. I've got the previous block hash. Uh, what else do I need? I need to know, I need to figure out the nonce. And I need to figure out the hash of this block. Okay. Well, let's just write a, a thing called uh, mine block. And that'll do all the actual mining, the computation work that'll do that for me. Okay. So I'll write mine block, uh, and that'll actually do the mining. Um, and of course, I missed one thing. I missed the uh, create genesis block. Create genesis block. Uh, this should be pretty simple. It just takes in a message. And uh, all it's going to do is create a block.new with no predecessor and the message. So very simple. OK. So how are we going to mine a block? Well, we can go and borrow our old code that we used for proof of work. Um, so we can just grab this. Uh, whoops. We can grab this, and we can just paste this in here, private. Paste this in. So we got the hash. We got finding the nonce. Uh, we'll still use Isle of Pony. Why not? Uh, we'll print the count uh, when we're uh, finding a nonce. And we've also got this. This looks good. Cool. Valid nonce. All right. So to mine block, what we're going to do is we're going to say at nonce equals find nonce. Okay. Uh, but now we're not just going to find the nonce for the message. Uh, we got to find the nonce for the entire block, right? So this block, uh, the nonce you find for this block includes your message and the previous block hash. Right. We need both in order to find the correct nonce. So uh, I'll have a method here. I'll write a little method called block contents. Okay? And this is just going to return uh, the, uh, the prev block hash uh, and the, uh, the message. I'm going to compact them in case I don't have a previous block hash. Uh, and then I'm going to join them so I get a string. Okay? This is how I'm going to compact everything and then uh, try to find something that, that, that hashes with that. So uh, I'm going to find a nonce. This no longer takes in an argument. Uh, and what it's going to do, it's going to say until valid nonce, and this is just going to pass in the nonce. Uh, and now valid nonce is just going to take in a nonce, and it's going to say hash of block contents uh, plus nonce. So take the, take the block contents, add the nonce, and see if everything there starts with that number of zeros. Make sense? So the same logic that I had before, uh, just you know, doing it in this class now. 
uh, instead. So I don't need that, and I can move this num zeros up here, except I don't want this to be six, probably I want this to be four, uh, or let's say five. Uh, cool. So uh, awesome, I also need a previ previous block hash to be set there, prev block hash. Uh, and then finally, last thing, is I have this uh, dot block hash method. I need a block hash. And the way I'm going to get a block hash, block hash, uh, is I'm just going to hash the contents here and pass in the real nonce. And now that'll just be uh, the previous block hash, the message, and the nonce all hashed together. That'll be the hash for the entire block. So all of that should work just out of the box. Uh, let's see if this does the trick. Um, and for now, what I'll do is I'll, I'll put uh, at block.last, so we can, or sorry, at blocks.last, so we can see as we're adding things to the chain. So uh, let's jump into stage, four, no, stage five. Okay. Uh, no block hash for nil class, so it's trying to look up the block hash for uh, if block, if previous block exists. So for the genesis block, of course, there's no previous block. Cool. So, uh, whoops. Okay, so that's ugly. I don't want that. Uh, I also want to delete this count. I don't care about that. Um, so I've got this nice little rendering code so we can actually see what's going on with the blockchain. So I'm just going to spit this out in here uh, to string, okay? Uh, and then I'm going to put uh, the, the blockchain there. I'm going to put each block. And now, oops, uh, undefined method yellow for nil, nil class. What am I doing? Yellow? Ah, okay, so it should be previous block hash. Uh, message, nonce, and this should be block hash. Okay, so last time, let's see if this goes. So it's mining, 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 mining. There's the first block, second block, and third block. There you go, there's a blockchain. Yeah, pretty cool. Your hashes don't start with zero, and I think you did hash at nonce, you did do block content. You are totally you are totally correct. My hashes do not start with zero, that's a problem. Uh, sorry, what do you say I did? Uh, up at the top, where you define, uh, let's see, block hash and mine block. You just did a hash of the nonce. You didn't put the. Oh, uh, hash of nonce. Oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, so, sorry. Hash of block contents plus nonce. Block contents plus nonce. Yes. I think that's the current hash of the, the current block. Yes. Is that right? Uh, let, let's try this one more time. Uh, make sure that we actually have the leading zeros because that seems pretty important. Yes, there we go. So now we got the leading zeros. Everything looks good. We can see that these hashes match up. Previous hash, own hash, right? So cool. We got a blockchain. All right. Yeah? Woo! Okay. So now that seemed pretty cool. Uh, and, and so now finally, one last thing, right? So uh, we want to check whether the blockchain is valid. And this is pretty important because if we're actually running cryptocurrency, we want to make sure that the blockchain is really valid. So what do we need to make sure if uh, to, to ensure that a blockchain is a legit blockchain? So uh, first thing, I want to make sure that blocks.all, uh, I want to check that all of the blocks are uh, actual instances of the, uh, uh, or sorry, I say block.is a block, okay? If something's not a block, something's gone horribly wrong, okay? So that's just the first check. Make sure you can't futz around with any uh, weird uh, classes. Okay, so everything needs to be a block. Second, I want to make sure that all the blocks are valid, right? Uh, blocks.all valid. How do I check if a block is valid? Um, well, Let's just write a method called valid, uh, and it'll check by, uh, valid by saying if uh, valid nonce with my actual nonce. If my actual nonce is valid, then I'm valid, right? Okay, just trust that works. Uh, uh, cool. Uh, the, the method does it for me. I don't want to waste time on that. Uh, so cool. So that will already check. It's got all the all the data there. It can check that the nonce actually works and does produce all the leading zeros. Um, but one last thing I need to do to check that uh, the blocks are valid. So even if all the blocks are valid and everything is a block, this still can be cheated. Someone can still produce a fake blockchain. How could they do that? Sorry? They should put in the same previous block. Put in the same previous block? What do you mean? Um, is there anything stopping you from doing it? Still a double spend? How, how, would, how would you do a double spend? Uh, is there a way to... So the problem is not double spends. Okay. The problem is not double spends. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I can just reorder the blocks however I want, right? So long that right now all I'm checking is that with the previous hash you tell me is the previous hash and the contents that everything is fine. But if you just shuffled around the blocks, this would actually say yes, everything is still valid, right? The blockchain has to be sequential, right? So if the blocks are A, B, C, and D, 
The previous hash of B needs to be the hash of A. Previous hash of C needs to be B. Previous hash of D needs to be C. Otherwise, it's not a blockchain, right? So uh, that's a, a little bit complicated to like encode that logic, but it turns out you can do that really nicely in Ruby. So you can say blocks dot each consecutive two. That'll be A B B C C D. Uh, it's a nice little method. They'll do that for me. Dot all A comma B uh, A dot block hash double equals B dot previous block hash. Okay. And if I do this uh, now, you'll see that uh, if I put b.valid, uh, it should print out true once it gets to the end of this blockchain. Uh, there it goes, mining, 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 uh, mining. OK, it's mining. All right, there we go. And uh, true, you can see it printed out true. The whole thing's valid. And if I, uh, if, if I shuffle the blocks, so if I do uh, b.blocks.shuffle, it'll, it'll show, let me, let me turn down the difficulty. Uh, that's taking a bit long. Um, you can see that uh, it returns false. So if you shuffle the blocks now, they're not going to be valid. Okay. So cool. Now I have an actual blockchain that's validating its correctness. Okay. Uh, and that, of course, is essential to make sure that your blockchain is actually trustworthy. So okay, got a blockchain. That seems pretty good. Now note something. I want I want to point something out. Okay. Uh, you know, we came to this talk to learn about blockchains. Right. Um, if if I started this talk and I just showed you that blockchain, you would have no idea why it mattered. Right? And in fact, it doesn't matter. A blockchain by itself solves nothing. Okay? A blockchain does not create a currency. It doesn't do anything interesting. It's just, it's just a linked list with hashes. That's it. Right? That's what a blockchain is. That's all a blockchain is. So anybody tells, tells you, like, oh my god, blockchain is going to solve everything. It's amazing. It's going to change the world. Uh, a blockchain, you just tell them, what, uh, it's just a linked list with hashes. What's the, what's the big deal? Okay? That, that is, in fact, correct. A, a blockchain is a linked list with hashes. Okay? So uh, what's the big deal? Well, uh, we said that we wanted three properties from our blockchain, okay? We said we wanted to slow things down, which proof of work will slow things down. We said we wanted to order all of the events, okay? And a blockchain, of course, forces an ordering on all events. Um, but finally, we said we wanted to make it hard to change that ordering, okay? How do we get this? Do we get this from a blockchain? Let's say that you had an attacker, okay? And that attacker wanted to change history. Right? So I like the movies Gladiator and Goodfellas and Fight Club because I'm just super into grungy, you know, hyper masculine films. And uh, the, this bad actor wants to say that, oh, this guy likes Twilight. Okay? <laughs> so uh, this is obviously very malicious and um, it's no good. So how can I prevent this from happening? How can I stop this bad actor from ruining, uh, changing history, going back and changing what already happened? So Satoshi had a simple idea to solve this problem. This, again, was part of his insight. Okay? He called this problem, the, uh, the solution, the fork choice rule. Okay? Here's the idea. Whenever there's a fork in the blockchain, meaning there's two branches, right? one is going this way, one is going the other way, okay? uh, users should accept the fork with the most blocks on it. Okay? Or in other words, the fork that has the most work. Because, of course, the work is proportional to the number of blocks because each block required an amount of work to produce it. Right? So this blockchain, or this, uh, this uh, chain, or sorry, this fork, has less work on it than the real one. And so all users are supposed to accept the real one, not the shorter one. Okay? Now, how does that, wh why does that work? Why does that matter? Well, here's the idea. Let's say the attacker has less computational power than everybody else. Okay? The idea then is that even if they start trying to make their block uh, or their uh, fork longer, they won't win. They won't be able to catch up with everybody else. Okay, so you know me and the other good person. We start building on the good blockchain. Uh, they start trying to catch up. They're working really hard. They're like, no, I want to make sure that you like these really crappy movies. Um, and so they add Mamma Mia to the end, and they're trying to keep up with me. But as more and more good miners are in the system, we're just going to outpace them. They're never going to be able to catch up. Okay, so all of the computational power they're going to expend. And remember, computational power is money. Okay? Why is computational power money? Because you know, at a certain point, as, as you know, a cryptocurrency becomes big enough, you're not just running this on your own machine, you're like renting machines in the cloud, you're renting machines in a data center, you're buying GPUs and running them like in mass, paying for electricity, you're using all of that power to try to mine. And unless you have more power than everybody else, you're not going to be able to catch up in the long run. Right? Everybody else is going to win, and the good chain is going to keep moving forward, so long as everybody else has more power than the attacker. Does that make sense? The network is literally secured by computational power. Okay? This is the insight of Satoshi. Okay? This is the big idea. The big idea is what if you had a currency that was secured by c computational power? And the presumption, of course, in the original Bitcoin network was that computational power was going to be totally decentralized. 
right? Is that everybody has a computer, and so you know, if you're a bad actor, you know, you can't get as many computers as everybody else in the world. That's not going to happen, right? Everybody has a computer. So all the good people who have computers, they can just levy their resources and they can use those computers to uh, secure the system and everything is hunky-dory. Uh, of course, it didn't turn out that way, but that's another side. We can talk about that later if people are more curious. Um, so that's the big idea. Now, of course, you might notice that the blockchain sometimes is going to split naturally, right? Sometimes no, no one's doing anything wrong. No one's trying to cheat anyone. Uh, but sometimes, you know, I might say, you know, Fight Club and someone else says, oh, Lion King, right? Which is also a pretty good movie. Um, sometimes that's just going to happen. So what do you do when that happens? Well, uh, in this case, no, nothing. We just keep going. So remember, in a gossip protocol, people over here might hear something there, and people over there might hear something different. Okay? And that's fine. The rule in cryptocurrencies is that you just accept the first block of length L, or size L, right? So if I have block 44, you have block 44, and I tell you, hey, here's block 44, you're like, oh, I already got one, don't worry, don't worry about it. Uh, then we, we just hear, take the first one we hear, and we build on it. Okay? And the idea is that in the long run, one of these two is going to win. Right? As we keep building, like, we might tie once or twice. Like, that'll happen. Right? So there's a tie, two blocks in mind at the same time, boo-hoo, that sucks. Okay? But as we keep building on each chain, one of them is going to pull ahead. Even if we tie again, eventually one of them is going to pull ahead. And even if, you know, this, this is going to keep getting less and less likely that we'll continue tying. Eventually one of them is just going to race ahead, and the probabilities tell you that the longer you wait, the more this goes to one. So notice, though, is that if we're thinking about a currency, right? Right here, given a fork, I can still double spend, right? As soon as there's a fork in the network, I can say, great, I sent my coin over, over to you, also I sent my coin over to you, I signed both of them, I just double spent, right? I double spent in Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency. Well, the idea is that a blockchain gives you probabilistic guarantees, okay? Again, this is one of the big ideas of Satoshi. Uh, we're gonna secure this probabilistically, so what that means is that the longer you wait, the less risk there is of a double spend, right? Because the longer you wait, the more likely it is that one chain is going to be so long that it's got so much work on it that no one will be able to undo it. There will be, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars of computation embedded in that blockchain that you cannot replicate. You can't fake that work. That work is like just there and it's totally for real. Um, so this is why in Bitcoin, actually, uh, it's recommended to wait six blocks before you consider a transaction final. Right? And the reason why they say that is that if you wait less than six blocks, uh, there's a non-trivial probability that the person will double spend on it. Okay? Now, in practice, this happens very rarely, uh, but there's actually a place you can go. If you go online to search double spends, you can actually see uh, like a broadcast of all the double spends attempted in the Bitcoin network. Uh, and it's very easy to see a double spend. Uh, and so that's why people wait so that the blockchain can kind of work out all these forks and all these kinks along the way uh, to become very unlikely. So you know, maybe there's like a 1% chance this person double spent, good enough for me, let's close out the transaction, here's your painting. Yeah? Okay, yes, question? Wait, what do you mean by waiting? Like, are you talking like the GPU mining to like... No, no, so when I say waiting, I mean literally like, so if I sent you a Bitcoin and I want a painting from you, okay, I send you the Bitcoin, you stand there and you wait until someone mines a block, and then a block on top of that, and then a block on top of that, and then three more until you have six blocks, and you say, cool, that one's not going away. That would happen for each individual. Yes, for each transaction. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going I'm to cut questions that we can hold questions to the end, because uh, I'm, I'm getting toward the end. Okay, so we now have all the pieces. Okay, so let's just reiterate what we got. We've got identity. We use identity through public private key cryptography. Okay, we have networking. We've got networking through a gossip protocol. Okay, we're they're totally decentralized. And we've got consensus. This was the big idea of Satoshi. So we get consensus through proof of work. Okay, this is why it's called Nakamoto consensus. Uh, we use the longest chain rule to decide when there are forks or when there's a lack of consensus. That's how we decide what is the canonical chain or what is the source of truth in the network. Uh, and finally, each node is going to revalidate all the work in the blockchain to ensure that everything is valid. Okay, so you don't just trust, when someone gossips to you, they tell you, hey, here's what's going on in the blockchain, okay? You don't just trust them, you don't just listen to them, we're cypherpunks, right? You don't do that. What you do is they give you the blockchain, you're like, all right, I'm gonna redo all the work and ensure that your blockchain is legit. And only then will I accept it, okay? Now, of course, because of the way proof of work works, it's really easy to check. It's really hard to do, but it's really fast to check. That's what makes it so, so useful as uh, this proof of work, right? If it was slow to do and slow to check, then this would be intractable. So that's the idea. Now, last but not least, let's build a cryptocurrency. Okay? All right, bear with me. We are, we are almost through. Uh, 
Last step. Okay, so this one is going to be kind of a doozy because, of course, we're combining all these big pieces together. Okay, so uh, I'm going to kind of run through a lot of this, but we're going to we're going to breeze over this. We're not going to go through all this code because it's a cryptocurrency. It's a lot of code. Okay, so we're going to start by looking at the blockchain. Okay, I've made some augmentations to this. So this is very much like our old one, except now instead of messages, we have transactions. Okay, uh, and so let's just look. So we can see here we got a transaction. Raise type error unless it's a transaction. Save it to TXN. Okay, look at the transaction class real quick. Here's where our public-private key cryptography comes into play, okay? When you create a transaction, you tell me who you're transferring from, who you're transferring to, and the amount, okay? But that's not enough. You have to sign it. If you don't sign it, I don't trust that you really told me to send that money, right? So you have to send me, your, you have to give me your private key so I can create a signature uh, that proves that you really sent this, okay? So we get to take the from, the to, the amount, uh, and then we sign using the, uh, the, the, this is the exact same thing that we had before with the uh, public key cryptography stuff, okay? So, uh, whoops, that went away. Um, cool. So uh, we take the signature and then we throw away the private key. Of course, your private key is secret. I'm just passing it in here for, for efficiency. Um, so the, uh, we can also check if a signature is valid by using the same stuff. Uh, and we've got like a, a, we sign actually the, the message, which is a digest of the from, the to, and the amount uh, in a, a, in a, through a hash function. The reason why we do that is that asymmetric uh, encryption is very slow. So generally speaking, we want to encrypt using uh, private keys a small amount of data as possible. So that's a transaction, fine. So now basically this blockchain does the exact same thing, does the same thing we were doing before, except instead of messages, it just has transactions. Cool, okay. Uh, also, the first person gets 500,000 500, from no one. Okay, that's the genesis block. So whoever creates the blockchain, they get 500,000 coins for themselves. Cool. Uh, so the only augmentation is this. So we check for uh, a block being valid. We check if it's a valid nonce, but we also check the signature on the transaction. Okay? If the person who's in the from column, remember, what is from, to, and amount? From is a public key. To is a public key. There are no names. There's no ports. It's all public keys now. Right? So the from public key, the person who's transferring to someone else, we have to check, did you... The from person signed the transaction. Okay, so we just ask the transaction, "Are you a valid signature?" Uh, and the transaction just checks uh, by using the the PKI stuff that we wrote before. Groovy. Okay. So uh, last thing, the only other augmentation to our blockchain. So now it takes transactions uh, and it checks signatures. Each transaction must be signed. Um, and the last thing is that uh, so we have you know this each cons two thing, but we also have this last thing which says all spends valid. Okay, so because our blockchain is not just a blockchain, it's also an application. The application is a currency, okay? And a currency has certain application level rules. One of the rules, and probably, probably the only one in, in, in a currency, is that you cannot spend past zero, right? And we have to ensure that. So we can't just ensure that all the blocks are valid and that they've been properly mined. We have to ensure that at no point when we replay all the blocks does anybody go into the red. If someone goes into the red, no good, this is an invalid block. Right? So uh, the way I check that, I just have this you know, blah, blah, blah method, whatever, you can read this code later. Okay, so uh, that's the blockchain. Great. Now, I've also got, uh, uh, let's see here, uh, I've got some help. Let me uh, split this right. Split right, okay. Um, cool. Uh, we've got the PKI. We've got this client. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so let's go ahead and write this currency. So I've got most of it already written. Uh, so we, we're using now for the peers, because we, again, we've got this peer-to-peer -peer network. Right? We've got the gossip protocol. For the gossip protocol to work, we've got to know who my peers are. I've right? got to connect to at least one person. Same thing as before. Uh, now I'm going to store it in an array instead of a map because uh, I'm not storing state. Peers are just for the network. My blockchain is a separate piece of state. Okay? Blockchain here, peers here. Totally separate. Okay? I don't care that your port is that. Your public key, you can use it from any port. You can use it from anywhere in the network. Okay? So those are now decoupled. All right, so I generate my own private and public key and store it in memory. Um, and if I am the progenitor, meaning I'm the first person to create the blockchain, meaning I have no peer, I'm going to create a new blockchain with myself as the progenitor, meaning I get 500k of a seed coin. Okay, cool. Otherwise, uh, I'm joining the network, so I'm going to add in the new peer for uh, whoever I'm joining in this network. Okay, great. So. Every three seconds, what I'm going to do is I'm going to gossip with the peers. Uh, this gossip method, uh, you can kind of ignore it, but basically it sort of does what you expect. Uh, does the gossiping, ignore that. Okay, you guys already got gossip. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, uh, so it's already gossiping every few seconds. I need to write the endpoints for this currency. Okay, these are what my nodes are going to do. Three methods. One is the gossip. Okay, this is when you receive incoming gossip, you take in their gossip, and you return your gossip. 
right? That's what gossiping is. So we're, we're going to write that. Uh, the second thing is that we need to send money in point. Okay? So the send money in point is how we actually send money to someone. So I'm going I'm to write to this node and say, hey, send money from you to them. And it's going to go send that money. Uh, and then finally, we need to get public keys. Uh, we'll, we'll look at that in a second. For now, let's just write the gossiping. So this should be pretty straightforward. Okay? So how do we gossip? Uh, we have two params. We have params blockchain. Okay? We say uh, their blockchain equals params blockchain. Okay? And so when it comes down the wire, what I'm going to do now, instead of using JSON, I'm going to code it using YAML. YAML is just another format like JSON. It makes it a little bit easier because I'm using these, uh, these Ruby objects. Uh, and Ruby will really nicely just deserialize it back into a Ruby class for me, which makes me avoid a lot of stupid stuff I'd have to do. If it was a JSON object, it would be literally just a hash. So I'll do yaml.load uh, params blockchain, and I'll say their peers. I also need to know their peers uh, because we're also doing the peer-to-peer -peer stuff uh, at the same time. Okay, cool. So now I'm going to have these. Uh, uh, I'm going to have these functions that I'm going to write uh, off to the side. I'm going to say, uh, let's see here. All right, I'm going to write a method called update uh, blockchain. I'm going to pass in their blockchain, and I'm going to have a method called update peers, and I'm going to pass in their peers, uh, and then finally I'm going to return my state. So to return my state, I'm going to yaml.dump my state, so that's going to serialize it into YAML, uh, and I'll just say blockchain, whoops, blockchain is going to point to my blockchain, which I'm using a global variable now for reasons that don't matter, uh, and peers are going to be my peers. Okay, so this should send all my stuff down the wire and I'm getting back their stuff. Uh, now I need to update my blockchain and I update my peers. Whoa, what happened? Whoa, what? What the hell? What? I, sorry, uh, let me, let me uh, just make this smaller and then make it big again. Whoa, what's going on? Resize the column. Resize the column, okay. No, no, it's, uh, all right, let's try, let's try reopening it. Uh, split it right, there we go. That's much better. Okay, uh, interesting. Someone want to file a bug report? Uh, okay, so um, awesome. All right, so let's update peers. Def update peers uh, with their peers. Okay, so this is easy. If you, if I'm talking to you and you have other peers, right? Uh, I'm just going to make my peers the intersection of my peers and your peers, right? So if you know some people I don't, well, I'll go talk to them. So I'll say uh, my peers equals uh, my peers plus your peers, uh, and just grab the uniques. Right? So just, just you deduplicate it, and then those are all my new peers. So that should be easy enough to update peers. Updating blockchain is a little bit more complicated. Here's where we use the fork choice rule. Okay? So I need to now choose, given your blockchain and my blockchain, how do I decide whose is better? Okay? So first thing I'm going to do is, if you don't even have a blockchain, which you might not because it's a peer-to-peer -peer network, if you're coming online and you don't have a blockchain yet, uh, I'm going to uh, re sorry return, uh, return if their blockchain is nil. Okay. If, you're if you don't have a blockchain, screw you. I'm just going to not even do it. Okay. Um, so uh, what else do I want to think about if I'm updating my blockchain? So if your blockchain is longer than my blockchain, or sorry, if your blockchain is shorter or equal to my blockchain, I will ignore your blockchain. Okay. That's the fork choice rule. Right. I don't choose another block uh, unless it's longer than mine. Just if it's not longer than mine, I ignore you. Okay. So I'll say return if uh, their blockchain dot length. I need to add a dot length to the blockchain. Actually, I'll do dot blocks dot length. Dot blocks dot length is less than uh, blockchain dot blocks dot length. Okay. So if your blockchain is uh, uh, return if it's uh, less than or equal to mine. Sorry, less than or equal to. Then I'm going to just skip you. Also, I need to make sure that they actually have a blockchain. Or sorry, that I have a blockchain because I might not return if blockchain and their blockchain uh, length is less than mine. Okay, great. Uh, now, finally, there's one last rule I need to check. Uh, with someone else's blockchain. Uh, the last one I need to check is I need to make sure their blockchain is valid, right? Because the idea is that we're cypherpunks. You don't trust anyone. People are shit, okay? They're going to lie to us. They're going to cheat us. They're going to give us fake blockchains, okay? So we got to ourselves validate that their blockchain is legit. They didn't cheat. So we're going to say uh, return unless their blockchain uh, dot valid, okay? And this is going to validate, do all the work that we wrote in the blockchain class to validate do the each consecutive to blah, blah, blah. It's going to do all that stuff. Finally, if you get to the end of that, then your blockchain is good. So our blockchain is your blockchain. Cool? Okay. So with this, with this alone, we should be able to get uh, some gossiping in a blockchain. So let's see if we can just get that going. Uh, here we go. Sorry. <laughs> kind, of a, kind, of a, kind, of a, kind of a trip there. Okay. So uh, let's go into the final stage. This is my final form. Uh, a seed coin. Here we go. So uh, this is the Hasib coin. It is going to create a blockchain. And here we go. Uh, 
help, I'm tra uh, this is the nonce. Uh, it started with help, I'm trapped in a nonce factory. Uh, and that's what it found. It also picks a name randomly, just so it's easier to read, because I thought that would make things better. So this, this one, it's, its port is uh, not set, because I didn't set a port. Uh, I got to make sure I set a port. Cpoin 1111. Okay, there we go. All right, so uh, I'm setting a port for this guy, uh, and this person's name was Ivani, and now it's Marjorie. Okay, so this person, the, the progenitor of the seed coin, is named Marjorie. Okay, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to connect to Marjorie. Uh, I'm going to connect uh, to the seed coin, uh, and I'm going to connect uh, my port is going to be 2222. I'm going to connect to 1111, and I'm going to get the state of the Marjorie blockchain. And there we go. My name is Jacqueline. I'm connected to you. And now I can see in the second chain that Marjorie has 500k. Right? Okay. Groovy. But uh, still not really any currency stuff going on. Uh, it's just sort of like printing out that these two things are synced on the blockchain. But now I want to actually spend money. I want to do some, I want to do some commerce. Right? So let's see if we can do that. Uh, uh, wrong way. Okay. Um, cool. So in order to uh, send money, I have, uh, I have two things. So I pass in a port number that I want to send the money to. Uh, so it's kind of like the port numbers are how we know each other, right? So like if I talk to you, then I would say, hey, what's your port number, right? That's how I know, that's how I know where to find you. I like message you on Facebook Messenger or whatever. I'm like, hey, I know your port number. Uh, what's up? I want to send you some money, right? You still need to send me your public key so I know actually how to send you money, right? That's like saying like, here's my wallet address. Uh, so just from your port number, I need to get your public key by talking to you and getting your public key. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, uh, pub key equals uh, params uh, two, that's your port number, and I want to get your port, get your public key from you. Okay, so I've written, uh, I've written a nice little helper for that uh, called get pub key, which is use Faraday hits the other other client. So I'm just going to do client dot get pub key from whatever port this is, and that should hit the client, or sorry, hit the other uh, person and give me their public key. Okay, cool. Now I've got your public key, uh, and now I need to get the amount. So I say amount equals params, uh, params amount. Okay, and now. What I got to do is I got to add a new transaction to my blockchain. Okay, let's look at the the block, the transaction. So a transaction takes four arguments: a from, a to, an amount, and a private key. So I'll say uh, transaction equals transaction dot new. A from, which is me, which is my port. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, not my port, my public key. That's my identity in the system. My identity is my public key. Um, a two, that's going to be your public key, right? So we'll call this their public key. Whoops. Uh, their public key, then uh, an amount, which is that, uh, I, I need to convert that to a number, uh, and then finally I need to pass in my private key so I can sign the transaction, right? If I don't sign it, it's not valid. So uh, priv key, which should be my private key, that's my transaction. Then I do uh, blockchain dot, uh, what is it, add? It's like add to, add to chain. Dot add to chain, the transaction, and I say okay. Uh, and now, Last but not least, I got to actually return my public key. Well, that is easy enough. Pub key, great. Okay, so with all of these ingredients, that, whoops, sorry. <laughs> uh, with all of these ingredients, let's uh, let's go ahead and kill these guys. Um, I want now to create a functioning cryptocurrency. Let's see if we can do it. Okay. All right. Here goes nothing. It's, it's big buildup. Okay. So. Uh, Here's going to be my progenitor, right? Uh, and progenitor, here we go. Uh, name is Aud Audrey. Okay, Audrey. Apparently, Google thinks that's a name. Okay, so uh, here's person two, and here is person three who's going to connect to person two, uh, except instead of gossip, it's going to be uh, Hasib coin. Okay, all right, so all three of them are now in the system. I'm going to make this a little bit smaller so we can kind of see a little bit more there. Okay. Uh, and we can see all the blockchains getting printed out, and they're all synchronized, they're all talking to each other. You can see they all can see each other's peers. Okay, here they go gossiping to each other. All right, now I'm going to load Pry, I'm going to load the client, and I'm going to start transferring money. Okay, who should I transfer money to? Uh, should I transfer money to Jenica? What are these names? Uh, or Jennifer? Okay, all right, real, real big on Jenny names. Um, all right, which, which Jenny do you think deserves some money from Audrey Ann? Jennifer. Okay, all right. Uh, Jenica or Jennifer? Come on. Jenica, all right. It's a clear consensus on Jenica. All right, so uh, we're going to do client.send money. Is it send money? Uh, uh, let's see here. Client, client.send money. Okay, client.send money to Jenica, whose port is going to be 3333. Okay, so you want to send money to 3333 from, uh, or I'm sorry, no, that, that's the, uh, the 
point we're sending. So we're sending this to Audrey. Audrey wants to tell Audrey, hey, send money to Jenica. Okay? So uh, send money uh, from port 1111 to port 3333, which is Jenica's port. Uh, and how much should we send Jenica? One? Okay. We're going to send Jenica one coin. There we go. Okay. There we go. We see the second block. Uh, Let's, let's make it smaller. We can see they all have two blocks now in their blockchains. You can see everybody says Jenica has one dollar and Audrey has four, four nine, a bunch of nines. Um, cool. Let's send money to someone else. Uh, let's see if we can get uh, Jenica to send her only dollar to Jennifer uh, because that, that is not a real name. Okay. Boom. So now we've sent a third transaction. You can see all of them now have three blocks. In their blockchain, actually, it's hard to see because it's too small. But there, you can see there down there, Jenica also has the three blocks. Everybody is mining on the same chain. They can all see the entire blockchain. Uh, and now, finally, the last thing that I want to show is that if somebody tries to cheat, the other people aren't going to accept it. Okay. So let's say that Jenica, because I don't trust Jenica, she's got a weird name. Uh, Jenica, who's port three 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 three, tries to collude with Jennifer because you know they're up to something. That's what their names are too similar. Um, so Jenica tries to send to Jennifer a hundred k coins. Okay, uh, and of course everybody knows Jenica doesn't have this money. She's she's of course she doesn't have money. Uh, so she tries to send this money, and Jenica's like, "Hey guys, look, I have negative a thousand, hundred thousand coins, and uh, Jennifer has a hundred thousand one, uh, but no one else cares. Everyone else is like, shut up, Jenica." We know, you're, we know you're full of shit. Like, no one cares that you think that. Uh, and everybody else is going along with their canonical chain, uh, and she's off in Rhode Island Land with her bullshit chain. Uh, <laughs> typical Jenica. Typical Jenica. Uh, cool. So that, right there, is uh, a cryptocurrency. <laughs> so, so uh, right on time. Um, so, we did skip a few things. I just want to note, uh, just really briefly, a few of the things that I kind of glanced over. So the first thing is that we didn't really talk about economics, okay? So in the real cryptocurrency system, they're generally speaking, they're miners who actually mine transactions for other people. Also, uh, you know, transactions, uh, we don't do one transaction per block, we do a bunch of transactions in one block, because of course it just saves, it, it, it's a lot more efficient to do it that way. Um, so we didn't really talk about miners, we didn't talk about block rewards, and this is a very important part of what's known as crypto economics which is how you incentivize, how you use incentives to create security in a system, okay? Um, so we didn't talk about economics. We didn't talk about Merkle trees or Merkle proofs. Uh, this is something that you might want to go into, which is an optimization that makes a lot of this stuff much more efficient. Um, we didn't talk about SPVs, also known as light clients. This is like the idea that if I don't have enough space on my mobile phone to sync the entire blockchain, which I usually won't, how can I still participate in the system? Well, you can use different protocols which often involve Merkle proofs, uh, and those are called uh, SPVs for simple payment verification, uh, or also known as light clients. Um, we also didn't talk about replay protection, right? So even in the system, I can basically say, great, I have, um, uh, if I have a message from you that says, I'm transferring you five coins, right? I can actually send that transaction multiple times on the blockchain and make you transfer to me multiple times, right? I, I can ask miners to repeatedly put that, put that thing in the blockchain because I have your signature, right? And so in order to prevent that from replay attacks, basically meaning like, I'm going to pretend you said this 20 times, uh, instead, I'm going to add a nonce to every time I say something, and I'm going to say, great, just like the version numbers, this is version number one of what I said, then version number two. And so now in the, in the blockchain, if we try to play your same message three times, I'm like, wait, there was already a message from you, like your last nonce was three, and this is also three, this is a replay, you're not really saying this again, right? Um, so, and finally, of course, uh, you guys have probably heard of Ethereum. Ethereum is not a currency on top of a blockchain, although it includes a currency, uh, instead it is a virtual machine that is implemented on top of a blockchain. But the blockchain is still sort of the, uh, the underlying uh, data structure that it uses to store its state and to undergo the state transitions, right? Instead of uh, transactions, it, it has state transitions in its virtual machine. So that's a whole other ball game, and uh, obviously we're not going to be able to go deep into that in a talk like this. Uh, if you're interested in this stuff, read the Bitcoin white paper. After this talk, if like, this talk mostly made sense to you, you can probably read this white paper and totally understand it. There's very little in there that will be opaque to you if you've understood what I basically just said. So uh, if you want to go deeper, I would recommend it. Um, that's it. Thanks for listening. Uh, you can find the code for my talk on my GitHub. Uh, this stuff is obviously going to be posted online, uh, and I'll send a link out to everybody who attended. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at adhasib or follow my blog if you're curious. Uh, and now I will take questions. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah, do you have your other hand? Yeah, so where does all the, like, server logic really 
does there still have to be like a central server for like individual like to verify. Right, so the, so the question for people online who might not have been able to hear, the question is where does the server live? Because if you have like clients, like clients are not going to be able to run the entire thing themselves. Where do they go to verify that this stuff is actually happening? Well, the idea basically is that if you're a like client, uh, you connect to other nodes that are doing this work for you. Okay? And so very often, um, if you're a like client, what you're going to do is you're only going to have like metadata about all the blocks. Uh, and well, so it, it, it's, it's kind of complicated, the actual algorithm, but basically you have like a much smaller version of the blockchain and just the metadata and the connections between the metadata to know what's going on at any given time in the blockchain. Uh, and basically what happens is you sync once and then you uh, kind of update your state periodically. Right? Uh, so if you're, if you're building a full node, then you need to replay the entire blockchain. Okay? If, you're, if you're like, I've you know, got a big machine, I want to make sure everything is valid, you're going to replay everything. Okay? But if you're a smaller node, what you might do is just hit a bunch of other nodes. And you might say, hey guys, uh, I trust that if I hit enough of you that like, not enough of you are going to be malicious. Everyone tell me what's going on right now. Where are we at at the chain? Okay? Then once we get to where we're at in the chain, then I just incrementally update that state, just hearing what are called the block headers, which is basically just the metadata of each block. Okay? So that's essentially the idea. Uh, it's, obviously that, that, didn't really, that probably didn't immediately click or make sense, uh, but you can read about SPV or like clients, and that'll tell you sort of some of the protocols that are used for uh, making it feasible to do this without running the entire blockchain. Yes? So I would assume that each block is a ledger, and since there's so many transactions in the world going on, like that's going to build up exponentially. How do they go through it? Yes. So uh, the question is, uh, so you assume a block is a ledger, that's going to grow exponentially. How do you keep it from... Take decimals too. So like, just, I'm, like, I'm yes. So, uh, so a few things there. So first of all, the ledger, when we say a ledger, usually what we mean is like a list of like, someone said, uh, you sent this, I sent that, he sent this, he sent that, right? So the ledger is actually the entire blockchain. A single block is like one entry of, of like a set of ledger entries, but the whole ledger is actually the entire blockchain. So uh, the blockchain will grow big. And this is actually one of the problems that's being debated right now in, in the Bitcoin world. So if you've heard of like the SegWit thing, like when Bitcoin forked into Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Regular and SegWit 2x is coming up. Uh, so all of these forks are basically people arguing about how fast are we going to let the blockchain grow. And some people are like, we should let it grow a lot so that more people can get their transactions into the system. And some people are like, no, screw that. If you, make the, if you let the blockchain grow really big, then it's going to be so big that no one's going to be able to run it except for like professionals. And now the whole idea of like this being decentralized and everybody contributing to the network, now it's only going to be like big data center people who are actually running the nodes and like you're back to centralization, right? If you just have like a few group of people who are actually running things big enough to load the whole blockchain, that's not security. So people argue about this, but you're right. One of the problems with blockchain is that they grow and grow and grow and grow. So uh, that, that makes it quite hard. There are ways using Merkle trees to make it more efficient to store a lot of that state so you don't have to actually store everything so long as you've verified it at least once. Uh, but it is, it's a hard problem and there's no easy solution to it. Yes? It's probably a two-fold question, but um, will Nantes will continue to be harder to get mined over time? Uh, will Nantes continue to be harder to get mined over time? Yeah. Yes. So Bitcoin has something built into it uh, so that Basically, the, there's like an auto-adjusting difficulty level. So we saw that like, you know, with five zeros, it was pretty hard. With six zeros, it was like insane, right? So Bitcoin has this thing where it automatically adjusts the difficulty so that each block on average will take 10 minutes. And this hard-coded into Bitcoin, and no one will change it because Satoshi's gone and no one wants to change it. So will transactions, is it possible for them to be limited by number of available nonsense? Like, that, so good question. Uh, not really, but there are some tricks that will sometimes get played. So it is possible sometimes... If the difficulty level is high enough, then it, is sometimes, it sometimes happens that a miner will basically iterate through every possible nonce and nothing worked, right? And nothing produced enough zeros. So what they'll do is they'll reorder the transactions and then try again. And that gives them a whole new search space because now it's a slightly different order, right? Even with one bit changed, the output is going to be entirely different. So if, you just, if there's little things you can fudge with, which you can if you're a miner, you can just like switch the order of two things, uh, then you can just try again and you start over from scratch. So in practice, it's not a problem, but uh, because like the permutations of all these transactions is like n factorial. So it's, it's, it's enormous. Yes? I read that there's like a, a finite amount of possible Bitcoin, and like 21 million Bitcoin that can be mined. Yes. So how is it that the blockchain can't keep growing? Yes, yeah, so the question is, um, there's a finite amount of, of, of Bitcoin, which is correct. There are 21 million Bitcoin that will ever be mined. Um, and so the last part of your question was, was what, what exactly? Why is it finite? Why is it finite? Because it was hard-coded. Satoshi decided that there would be, uh, that uh, basically, 
they would be deflationary. They would be, they'd be uh, they would asymptotically decrease toward 21 million. Uh, and uh, after that, no one will ever mine a new Bitcoin. Uh, they will mine transactions, but they won't get Bitcoin uh, rewards. So the way that Bitcoin works is that when you mine a block, you get a reward as the miner. And so you would get, uh, I think currently it's like 12.5 or something like that, Bitcoin or something like that. I don't remember. Some, some number. Um, and this, this reward also goes down over time. And the, the asymptotic decrease of this reward, as it goes smaller and smaller and closer to zero, eventually it'll stop. And when it stops, no more Bitcoin will ever get minted, and all 20 million will, that ever existed will be allocated to people. And that's the idea behind Bitcoin. Yes? So what's the incentive to mine that? So what's the question is, what is the incentive to mine after the, the block reward goes away? Uh, the idea is that transaction fees. So right now, if you're in Bitcoin and you want to get your transaction mined, right, you're probably not going to mine it yourself because... You're not going to mine it yourself. Uh, so <laughs> what you're going to do is you're going to send your transaction through the network. Uh, and what you're going to do is you're going to say, so Bitcoin has this complicated model called UTXO. But the simple idea is that what you say is that I'm just going to send $5 through the network. okay? Uh, and I'm going to send 4.5 of that to my friend. Well, what about the other 0.5? You don't say where it goes. And it's part of the Bitcoin protocol that that extra 0.5 that you leave over is kind of like a tip for your miner. Okay? And that incentivizes the miner, if there are a bunch of transactions waiting to get mined and included into a block, the miner's like, oh, I'm going to take, take that 0.5. Uh, and they take that, they include it into their block. And so now, basically, even right now, uh, if you want to get your block included into the Bitcoin blockchain, you need to add a significant fee. And so usually, you need to spend like at least, like, I think it's like, you know, wanders around 3 to $7, uh, depending on how much congestion there is in the network, to get a Bitcoin transaction mined, which is really expensive. And that's one of the reasons why there's this big argument right now about the block size. One of the reasons why it's so expensive is that there's so much competition for small little blocks, given how many people are now using the Bitcoin network. Right? So the Bitcoin network was not really designed to be used by this many people, and it's getting that there's so much contention for the blocks that for miners, it's like, well, someone else wants $5, so if you pay me less than that, I'm just not going to include you. Why would I? This person is willing to pay me more. Right? So uh, that's what creates the economics behind Bitcoin. Eventually, when the block awards go away, uh, transaction fees will just go up most likely, because uh, miners need incentive to keep mining. Yes, question over there. Yes, uh, uh, let's say that uh, we want to look at a specific uh, record in the blockchain, and how would we, like, uh, let's say we want to look at the specific message from way back of the past year, mm -hmm. how, I think the blockchain is like a, a link list, yeah. a long list, is there a way that we can um, look it up a uh, more efficient way than uh, if we do the, the yeah, good question. So the question is essentially, if I have, if a, if a blockchain is a giant link list of blocks with hash pointers, uh, is there a way if I can like, you know, let's say I want to go back like one year and find a particular transaction, is there a way that I can find that quickly? Uh, the answer is yes. You could just use a binary search. Uh, so, you know, it's not super complicated, like, you could basically look in the middle, uh, have like store a pointer to the middle block, store a pointer to the end blocks, have pointers that, you know, each block, you know how binary search works, uh, so yeah, you can do that quickly. Uh, but more likely, you'll like know which particular transaction you want to look at. And there are a lot of block explorers you can use online to look through the Bitcoin blockchain, the Ethereum blockchain, and give you an idea of what these transactions actually look like in the wild. Yes? I've heard that Ethereum is like, a lot easier to mine uh, because it's not like, uh, you don't have an advantage if you have specialized hardware. Uh, like why is that exactly? Okay, yeah, good question. So the question is, uh, I've, you heard that Ethereum is easier to mine because it doesn't require specialized hardware. Why is that? So the, it's, it's not entirely true. There's, it's kind of a complex story behind that. So Bitcoin was the very first cryptocurrency ever created. And then a lot of currencies, uh, often called altcoins, were sort of clones of Bitcoin with like little features attached, because the Bitcoin community didn't really want to change it very much. So Bitcoin right now is very similar to how it was originally in 2008 when Satoshi invented it. Okay? Uh, so Bitcoin hasn't changed very much. Uh, and so what that meant is that uh, Bitcoin, of course, was also the biggest currency. So there was the most incentive to mine it. Now you can see that uh, to, to mine Bitcoin, like I showed you exactly what you do to mine Bitcoin. You, you iterate SHA-256 hashes until you find a nonce with a certain number of zeros. That is literally the proof-of-work algorithm in Bitcoin. Okay? Now, it turns out SHA-2 is very computationally intensive, okay? uh, but it's also very parallelizable. So what that means is that you can use multiple cores to run SHA-256 computations in parallel. Okay? Uh, and that's really great, because what people realize is that if you use a GPU or a graphics card, graphics cards are designed to do like really fast mathematical bit computation stuff and floating point stuff and blah, 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 and they're also very, very parallel. 
because you need a lot of that stuff for like vectorized graphics and all that shit. So uh, graphics cards, turns out, if you just like kind of mod them to just do SHA-256 hashes like crazy, you can get much better uh, throughput than you can using a CPU. A CPU is designed for general computation. A GPU is designed for like highly parallelizable numerical computation. So it turned out that people realized like, hey, GPUs, you can do this stuff way faster. And pretty soon it became totally unprofitable to mine Bitcoin on a CPU. You had to use a GPU. Otherwise, you just weren't even in the running, okay? So if you have a graphics card, some big machine, a gaming rig, great, you can mine Bitcoin. Otherwise, it's like not even worth the money. You'll pay more in an electricity bill than you will in the actual Bitcoin you get, okay? And then Bitcoin started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And people were like, well, shit. Now this mining is becoming like a really serious business, okay? And then what people started doing was they were like, okay, GPUs are pretty good. But if all we really wanted to do was just mine Bitcoin, we could probably do even better than a GPU. There's a lot of stuff in there we don't need. A lot of stuff like floating points and video games and blah, blah, blah. We don't need all that garbage. So what they did is they created these things called ASICs. Uh, and ASICs are basically like customized circuits that all they do is they compute SHA-256 hashes. And they were created just to mine Bitcoin. Right? Bitcoin mining is a multi-billion dollar industry now. And it's mostly centralized in China. There are like, you know, seven companies or something that own like 70% of the hashing power. And all they do is they run giant rigs of these ASICs. That all they do is they just run Bitcoin computations. They just run SHA-256 hashes over and over and over again and spit out the results. Okay? So if you were trying to mine Bitcoin today, it wouldn't even be worth, it would be, it would be worth, you wouldn't get anything. You wouldn't get anywhere. Because those ASICs are so much more efficient than even a GPU, it wouldn't be worth your time. Okay? So Ethereum comes along. In uh, 2013 is when it was first invented, 2014, I believe, or maybe it's 2014, and 2015 is when it launched. Um, so Ethereum came along much later, right? So there were seven years after Bitcoin that Ethereum finally launched. And with Ethereum and with a lot of other currencies, uh, including Litecoin, uh, they looked at what was going on with Bitcoin. They were like, this sucks. This is not the vision that Satoshi had for de decentralization, right? Like, in reality, all the mining is totally centralized in these giant Chinese companies, right? That's insane. That's not really the system we wanted. So they said, how can we make it so that there's no way to make this currency mineable by customized hardware? We want to make it so that normal people can mine this, okay? So here's, here's their, their idea. What they did is that, so SHA-256 as a proof-of-work algorithm is very computationally hard. And, and you know, Satoshi's idea, his vision, was that computation is like decentralized, right? Everybody has more computation than like just some random attacker. No longer true, right? A random attacker could just buy a bunch of ASICs, and now they have a shitload of power. <clears throat> but one thing that, so you can optimize away anything that's computationally hard. But there are some algorithms you can use for proof of work that are memory hard. And what memory hard means is that instead of requiring a lot of computation, it requires a lot of memory. So you need like, you know, 24 gigs of memory, and then this, this computation, in order to actually make it work, you just got to fill up your RAM with a bunch of crap, and then like combine it back together, and then get the result, and there's no way to skip that. You have to take up a bunch of memory. So the idea behind uh, uh, Ethereum's hashing algorithm called ETHash, uh, I, I think a Litecoin uses script, which is also memory hard. Uh, the idea is that if you want to solve this algorithm over and over again, the, the bottleneck is not computation. The bottleneck is memory, and everyone owns memory. Right? There's no specialized hardware for memory. We just call it RAM. RAM is the specialized hardware for memory. Right? So the idea is that because everybody has RAM, everybody's kind of on an equal playing field. Sure, you can be a little bit faster with the computation, but the hard part is the memory stuff. Just putting stuff in the memory and loading it from memory. And so that's why Ethereum and other cryptocurrencies that are more modern, they tend to use memory hard proof of work algorithms rather than computation hard. Uh, and that's why, yes, if you, have a, uh, if you have a lot of memory with your machine, you can mine uh, Ether which is the currency of Ethereum, uh, and make some money, whereas Bitcoin, it wouldn't be worth your time. Cool. Sorry, that was a super long answer. That was super intense. All right, I'm going to take one more question, and then we'll call it, because I can see that this is getting pretty rough. Yes? Uh, I think you uh, recently wrote something uh, about an attack that happened on, on one of the currencies. Yes. So what, because I mean, this all sounds great, and like, you, you saw that like, the transaction, because I hit the other, the other members of yeah. the, the peers. Yeah. Like, so what was that attack, or like, what are still some of like, the gaping vulnerabilities of the blockchain? Sure. So the attack, so the question was like, what was the attack that I wrote about and what does it have to do with any of the stuff I just talked about? Uh, so it basically has nothing to do with what I talked about. So uh, the attack that I wrote about in my, in my blog post was a, a $32 million hack that happened on the Ethereum blockchain. And the Ethereum blockchain is basically a blockchain which instead of being a currency, it includes a currency, but the primary point of Ethereum is to be uh, basically a decentralized computer. And everybody can run like programs on this computer. Okay? Uh, and we all agree about the state of the computer. And we use the currency to pay people to make the, make the computer do stuff. That's Ethereum. That's the big idea. Okay, so uh, in Ethereum, someone wrote a program 
to control a bunch of money. And their program had a bug in it, and an attacker stole that money out of their program. Okay? So the problem wasn't that like Ethereum was broken or that blockchain was broken or that consensus doesn't work. The problem was that someone wrote a program on, on Ethereum and their program was not correct. And someone was able to go and reach into that program, grab 32 million bucks, uh, and run off of it. And if you want to read my blog post, I'll talk a lot about like what exactly happened, what it means, and uh, give you some more context about uh, how all that fits in. So that is an example of what's called a smart contract. And a smart contract is basically this idea. It's the idea of a, a program on a blockchain that can directly interact with money. Right? So normally, if you, have, if you and I have a contract, right, it's one of the big ideas of blockchains. If you and I have a contract, then in order for the contract to, be, to work, like one of us pays the other one in, in real money out in the real world, and then like if I want to collect from you, I can like go knock on your door, I gotta send you a letter, I gotta go, you know, yell at you or I don't know, hit your car or something, right? I gotta do what I gotta do to get my money. Uh, that kind of sucks, right? It's very inefficient, it's a lot of work, uh, it's kind of a hassle. So the idea is that in a smart contract, the contract itself enforces the transfer of money. Right? So if you don't pay me, I don't go to a judge, I don't go like, you know, call your mom, I don't do any of that stuff. I just the blockchain does it for me, because it's all written into a program. And the money is in the program. So there's no like, oh, I'm not going to give the program my money. The money is in there. And so you can use a lot of like advanced cryptography. You can use like a lot of game theory ideas. Uh, you can do a lot of amazing stuff that you can't do in the normal world using smart contracts. So this is like one of the big ideas behind blockchain. Okay, I'm going to call it there. It's been long enough. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, that was a night. Oh, awesome job. Yeah. yeah, love it. Let's go chop some time. Maybe this yeah, is definitely, definitely. Oh, shoot you a message. Sounds good. Let me